Chapter 20 Center Point Station Fire Control Chamber Smoke filled the air, pooling against the ceiling and being battered in various directions by breezes from air vents. Technicians, unused to immediate action, fumbled with fire suppressors. One leapt away from his station as his keyboard suddenly glowed red. Flames licked up through it, consuming its keys. Admiral Delpin moved from station to station, issuing orders, forcing technicians back into seats or shooing them out of chairs too near burning and sparking control boards as the situation warranted. And all the while, Prime Minister Koyin stood where he was, bellowing in ever-escalating volume, What happened? What happened? What happened? Denjak Stepler caught his arm. They don't know yet, sir. You're not helping. I don't have to help. I'm the criffing five worlds prime minister. I want answers. Answers don't exist yet. Tepler's voice was low, but there was a trace of durasteel in his words. You'll get your answers faster if you stop interfering. Koyan stared at him as if debating whether to bite off the top of his skull, but nodded and shut up. A moment later, Delpin directed one of the technicians over to the knot of politicians. The man, yellow-skinned, bearded, with long hair in a braid and a patch of soot discoloring the left side of his face, offered Koyan an awkward salute. Sir, the weapon fired. Are you sure? The man nodded. But the system overloaded. Getting past the old security interlocks, the way the system imprinted on Anakin Solo all those years ago, so that only he could fire it, has been problematic. So we fired the system, and it punished us. Koyan shook his head. I don't get it. The technician paused struggling for a way to explain it to the politician. Think of the station as a body. It has a brain. We are a second brain trying to take over the body, and the first brain is resisting. We take over an area, and the brain retaliates by doing something to foul us up. In this case, we assumed control of the trigger finger, and when we fired to retaliate to mess us up, it stuck its thumb in our eye. Oh. Koyan nodded, clearly believing that he understood some of that. So we fired it. What happened at the other end? No way to know until we get some eyewitness reports. There's a thumb in our eye, remember? Admiral Delpin moved toward them. We've lost all contact with the decoy fleet. Their holocoms are not responding to our queries. Not even automated pings. That suggests they were all wiped out. And if they were... The Alliance vessels were too. Koyan nodded and mopped his brow again. Good. I hope you're right. How soon before we can fire again? The technician shrugged. Unknown. Part of that thumb in our eye looks like power system overloads, and the targeting may have to be recalibrated, which means re-entering a lot of star data. Days? A few weeks? Get on it. Koyan turned away and marched to the door escaping through it into the fresher air of the hallway beyond. His retinue followed him, all but Tepler. He raised his voice to be heard over the chaos. Ladies, gentlemen, the office of the Prime Minister thanks you for all your hard work. You've done extremely well. He gave them a raised fist gesture of support and enthusiasm, then turned to follow Koyan. Admiral Delpin stood before him. 
she whispered so only he could hear, You're an accomplished liar, but I mean that in a good way. He gave her a half-smile. Thank you. Um, when Fenner finds out. He'll roast us with words alone. Anything I can do to take some heat off you? Just make it clear to him that I was following orders, and I take them from the Corellian government, not from the Confederation Supreme Military Commander. She glanced in the direction Coyan had gone, and was not completely able to keep an expression of distaste from crossing her face. I'll do that. And if we've killed Jason Solo and crippled the Second Fleet, it was worth every bit of burn. Tepler nodded in agreement. Good luck. You too. Aboard the Anakin Solo The Anakin Solo, its hangars stuffed with surviving starfighters from not only its complement, but also those of several Second Fleet vessels, its hyperdrive damaged by the gravity-wrenching effect of the attack, limped back into Coruscant space. Kytus paced the bridge, not having slept since the catastrophe. He wanted to spend every moment with Alana, to be there for her when she awakened from the deep sleep that had claimed her. But he could not. To be away from his duties for so long would alert his crew that he had other priorities— he could not have them asking questions, not even as loyal a crew as he commanded. The enemy had made Centerpoint Station's primary weapon operational, and had used it to try to kill him, him personally. It was a tribute. They knew he was the most significant individual in the galaxy, the one person who could lead the Alliance to victory. They had panicked and they had failed to kill him. But without knowing it, they had tried to kill Alana. They would pay for that. Everyone who had supported Corellia during this action would die, or end up stamping out bits of Alliance trooper armor in a prison workshop, or be fed to rancors. Captain Neville approached. The Quarren was as upright and formidable-looking as ever, but the skin of his face and mouth tentacles was paler than usual. Sir, we're in planetary orbit. I'd like to transmit a request for permission to take a berth at the orbital shipyards. Get repairs underway immediately. Kytus glanced at him. Granted. Admiral Neothel has sent a request that you meet with her immediately at the Senate building. No. I'd be away when Alana wakes. I can't leave the Anakin Solo at a time like this. Reply that we can have a meeting here, or by Holocom. Yes, sir. It occurred to Kytus that there was something he should have asked before now, something he had not. What was it? Oh, yes. Crawl. In the force we lost, did you have any family? Yes, sir. Neville seemed to sag just a centimeter, then straightened. My son Turl, an ensign, a weapons officer aboard the frigate Chismere. I'm sorry. Kytus tried to feel sorry tried to remember that Turl was to Neville as Alana was to him. But that mathematical equation was as close as he could come. Turl Neville was a nobody, and now he was a nobody twisted and compressed by unimaginable gravitational forces into a tiny spot in space. Still, Kytus managed to keep an expression of sympathy fixed on his face. Neville apparently accepted it as such. 
Thank you, sir. He turned away, walking stiffly to return to his duties. The meeting took place in Kytus's private office. Again, Admiral Neothel stood and paced, while Kytus, imperturbable, sat. The second fleet is a shambles. Neothel's voice was deeper than usual, its pitch lowered by emotion. Kytus nodded. The flagship, Blue Diver, was lost, and Fleet Admiral Limpin with her. Well, she wasn't all that spectacular an admiral anyway, was she? I know. It's a disaster. I told you it was a trap. We just had no conception of the scope of the trap. Lure me out into open space? Send up some derelict warships with skeleton crews to hold me in place for a few moments, and then fire the biggest gun in the universe at us. It had the elegance of simplicity. How did you survive? Kytus sighed, then mentally trotted out the story he'd spent some time working up. During my discussions with Captain Hawklaw, I felt a presentiment in the Force, a realization that part of the plan, a sideline to it, was that an elite unit was coming to retrieve the Hapen Princess Alana. That's what the Jedi Solo was there for. Once she escaped my security team, I retrieved the girl from her holding area and took her out in a starfighter to lure the retrieval team to me. The team consisted of Jedi in stealth exes. To my surprise, they were willing to kill me and let the little girl die too. So I admit I underestimated their priorities a bit. Still, I had no problem eluding them until the primary wave of relief arrived, a squadron of starfighters, and drove them off. I'd ordered the Anakin Solo to follow the starfighters, which is why it was away from the engagement zone when the center point weapon fired. Ah! Neothel gave him a that-makes-sense nod. You're lucky. Yes. We need all our leaders to be lucky. I agree. We just lost a lot of unlucky commanders and ships we cannot replace. The Corellians traded us a flying junkyard for modern ships of the line. Confederation military strength may exceed ours now. With Centerpoint Station active, it certainly does. Kytus smiled. Admiral, we've just won this war. That soft-spoken assertion stopped Neothel in the midst of her pacing. Say that again? The Corellians just handed us the Trillion Credit Game Prize, the solution to our problems. We've won. How? We go to the Corellian system and take center point station from them. And then we point it at anyone we choose. Neothel's skin darkened. A color change Kaida suspected was similar to a blush or a flush of anger. Ah, I had not realized that it was so simple. Shall I pack a lunch? Kytus waved her sarcasm away. After Ben and I disabled Centerpoint, it wasn't worth the loss we'd sustain if we devoted all our forces to take it. And at the time, we wouldn't have been willing to use it immediately. But now, if we mount a major naval offensive at the moment they think our navy is at its weakest, we can take it. 
and now we have the will to use it. You and I, we are that will. The Admiral stood there for long moments, once again studying him, her own face inscrutable. Do you have a plan? I will by tomorrow. Neathal nodded. She turned and left. Chapter 21 Aboard the Anakin Solo, Main Hangar Bay Sea Al Antilles threaded her way through the Anakin Solo's main hangar bay. Ordinarily, this would have been no special task. But currently, the space was overcrowded with starfighters. Not just the vessel's usual complement, but most of the vehicles that had survived the Centerpoint Station attack. Now starfighters were packed in far more tightly than the floor markings indicated was normal, and mechanics had been working twenty-hour days to repair and maintain them. A diminutive woman with short brown hair and bangs that went awry whenever the faintest breeze crossed her face, Seal searched among the alphanumeric designations painted on walls, ceilings, and floor sections. V-17 was her destination, and only after she squeezed between two armored troop carrier shuttles did she spot it. An ordinary Lambda-class shuttle, its atmospheric wings locked into the up position, marked with alliance symbols on bow, sides, and stern. She approached it from the front and waved at the uniformed pilot, dimly seen through the forward viewport. He waved back, and moments later the vehicle's boarding ramp descended. She climbed the ramp with quick, nervous steps and pitched her voice to carry throughout the vehicle. Loot! Uh, Captain Antilles... Reporting as requested. At the top of the ramp, she turned forward, facing the shuttle's main compartment, which was laid out in a standard VIP profile. Only a few seats, all plush and able to swivel, with a small table beside each one. But the cockpit door was closed, and there was no one in sight. Hello? The boarding ramp rose, locking into place. Suspicious, she put her hand against the small of her back, where her holdout blaster was holstered under her tunic. Pilots were not supposed to go armed in secure areas aboard ship, but her mother had taught her that at times obedience to the letter of the law was an invitation to assassination. The cockpit door swung open. In the doorway stood a man of average height, in the dress uniform of Galactic Alliance Starfighter Command, he was middle-aged, lean, with hair that had changed over the years from pale blonde to white, and features that were aristocratic but sympathetic. His eyes were a startling blue. He offered her a smile. Welcome back, Sial. Uncle Tycho! She ran to him, wrapped her arms around him, and held him close for a moment. It's so good to see you. You act as though I were the one in danger. He led her back into the main compartment, sat her down in one of the overstuffed chairs, and took a seat in the one opposite. Captain Antilles. I thought that was a glitch when I saw it on the rescuee roster. Seal shook her head. A field promotion... I shot at Luke Skywalker, and he decided I warranted a raise in grade. Though she tried, she couldn't keep the pain, the bitterness, out of her voice. A consolation prize for losing my entire command. My fiancé. Fiancé? Tycho registered shock. I knew you were seeing someone. Tiam Rordan fighter pilot off the frigate Morunner. Unable to stand the sight of the sympathy on Tycho's face, she looked down at her boots. It wasn't official. We weren't even going to think about getting married until the war was done. 
Seal felt tears begin to well up. Tears again, for the thousandth time. She dashed them away and stared at Tycho, daring him to notice them. He just shook his head. I'm so sorry. Yeah. She fidgeted. Her left knee began vibrating. Early warning that nervous energy was going to cause it to start bouncing up and down soon. She pressed down on her knee with her palm. Is Winter all right? Tycho nodded. She's fine. See all. As good as it is to see you, I actually sent for you in an official capacity. Ah, see all straightened. What can I do for you, General? For a moment, Tycho looked a touch sadder, as though her sudden reversion to officer's manners was as unwelcome as it was appropriate. You know that these days I'm serving as an analyst for Admiral Neofel. Seal nodded. I wish you were training pilots again. The rookies could really use your experience. Thanks. What I need from you is... Well, the truth. The truth with no protective coloration, no filtering. She considered. Off the record? And have you swept this shuttle for listening devices? Yes, and yes. Remember, like you, I live in a mixed household. Pilots and spies. That almost fetched a smile from her, but she didn't have any smiles left. Fire away, General. I need intelligent observations from a field officer's perspective. About morale. The course of the war. About Colonel Solo. She had to think about it. I'm not sure what to say. I don't have a context. Maybe that's the problem. How can you have a perspective if you have nothing to compare things with? I don't. My squadmates don't. I mean, didn't. I don't understand. I remember the Yuzhan Vong War. I was only a kid, but it's all still so vivid. Everyone I knew was fighting for the same thing. Survival. It was simple. If we lost, we died. And we died out. If we won, we didn't. This war, though... Those of us who were in uniform when it started trusted that they'd tell us what it meant, and that it would make sense. But they told us, and it didn't. She took a long, shuddery breath. It's getting crazier and crazier out there. It's like both sides are starting to see each other as nothing but droids. I keep hearing stories about infantry units who report that they found enemy towns and compounds blown up, part of some Confederation scorch and thwart policy. But Scuttlebutt has it that their ground forces are reporting the same thing about our towns and compounds. And I know we don't have a policy like that. And someone at Centerpoint Station pressed a button to wipe out our entire task force the other day. Pressed a button! I'm scared to death that they'll do it again. But I'm even more scared that next time I'd be willing to push that button. Finally the tears came, and she put her head down into her hand. Since this started, I've shot at one of my heroes, Luke Skywalker, and at my own father. The Alliance and the Confederation both say awful things about both of them. Neither one of them deserves it. It doesn't make any sense. Tycho's tone was kind, but his words pressed her on implacably. And Colonel Solo? Everyone's afraid of him. 
Everyone. Nobody talks about him. Have you ever heard of that? Someone whose own people never talk about him? Once or twice. A long time ago. Tycho sighed. See all. Do you want out? Jolted and angered by his words, she sat upright and glared at him. I don't want to run. I just want it to make sense. I'm not asking you to run, or to dishonor your uniform. I'm asking, all else being equal, do you want out? No. I want to be doing something I think will help bring the war to an end. My captain's insignia. It's not worth the medal it's stamped from without that. I'm not going to dishonor my uniform. But the way things are going, I can't seem to bring honor to it. Do you know what I mean? You're talking to a man who used to fly for Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine, whose subordinates never talked about him. She wiped at her tears. I'm sorry, Tycho. I forgot. Don't apologize. You have nothing to apologize for. He studied her. You'll get new orders in a day or two. They'll look awful. They'll look like something no commander with any sense would do to an ace like you. Don't protest. Don't make waves. Just go where they tell you. I'll be there. Yes, General. Can you get in touch with your father? She nodded. I haven't. Technically it would be treason. But I can. It's not treason if a commanding officer orders you to do so. True. I so order. Yes, sir. I don't know how much time it will take. My means of reaching him are bound to be just as slow and uncertain. That's why I'm doubling my chances by asking for your help. He gave her his gentle smile again, his Uncle Tycho smile. So, official talk is over. Is there anywhere around here to get a good cup of calf? Not the paint remover they serve around the hangar? My gunner's webs on, brews up a good one. Lead the way. Corellia, Coronet, Command Bunker The hologram at the center of the darkened chamber showed a lean man in a dark officer's uniform, that of a Confederation general. His face was scarred, his body rigid, and he was only a double handspan over a meter tall, as Prime Minister Coyen had instructed his technical team to keep the hologram to a manageable size. The reduction in stature did not affect the general's voice, however. Rich with anger, it resonated, vibrating Coyen's sternum, echoing off the chamber walls. Center Point Station is a Confederation resource. Utilizing it without coordinating with my office constitutes dereliction of duty, and more important, gross incompetence. It's a Corellian resource, General Fenner. We chose to use it in an effort to end the war precipitously. Coyen shrugged. And we don't know that it hasn't had that effect. Jason Solo, one of their two chiefs of state, is dead. His partner, Admiral Neothel, is more reasonable than he was. Our stealth craft in the Coruscant system report the Anakin Solo reaching planetary orbit. How do you conclude that Solo is dead? Koyan felt his stomach sink as though he'd unwittingly stepped onto a turbo-lift and it had suddenly plummeted forty stories. He tried to keep his dismay from his face. 
Our starfighters reported all Alliance capital ships in the engagement zone destroyed. The Anakin Solo had apparently withdrawn from the engagement zone by the time the weapon was fired. So in your effort to eliminate the forces besieging Corellia, and one, only one, of the Alliance's important strategists, you've given away the secret of the station's functionality, tipped the balance of power by a few percentage points, and otherwise accomplished nothing. Whereas if you'd worked with me and my office, we could have put together a much more telling stroke, one that genuinely would have turned the tide of the war. Koyan shook his head. We were lucky to have rooted out all spies who might have gotten the information about the station's repairs to the G.A. Add your people to the mix. It becomes too complex to keep secrets. I don't say this often, Koyan, but I'll say it now. You're an idiot. Which makes you an even more exceptional idiot. For saying it to the man with the most destructive weapon ever created. As you have the most destructive weapon ever created, you are clearly capable of defending the Corellian system without aid from the rest of the Confederation. No need for synchronized fleet movements, for sharing intelligence with the other worlds, for food, medicine, supplies... That brought Koyan up short. Until the station was operational again, those resources were incalculably valuable. Common sense dictated that he take a step back, offer some appeasement, play nice. As an experienced politician, he knew this. But his next words surprised even him. Don't threaten me, General. You wouldn't like the results. He gestured to his technicians, invisible outside the glow of the hologram, and the image of Fenner disappeared, plunging the chamber into blackness. Gulping, Koyan turned toward the chamber exit. He probably shouldn't have done that. On the other hand, it was important to show the Confederation which world held the controls, and which ruler was boss? The answers were Corellia and Sadris Koyan. Chapter 22 Kashyyyk, Mytel Base, Hangar Housing the Millennium Falcon Jaina trotted into the hangar office, a set of improvised rooms set off from the rest of the building by sheets of corrugated durasteel, that now served as headquarters and workshop for the Alima hunters, and paused just inside the door. The main office was dark. Jag? His voice floated through the curtains separating this chamber from the next. Workshop! She moved to and through the curtain. We have some preliminary results from Talon Card on the data from Jason's shuttle. Seeing what stood in the center of the workshop, she stopped short, staring. Surrounded by tables and shelves piled high with metal parts and electronic components, was a man. Probably a man, though he could have been some new variety of battle droid. Most of him was covered in a jumpsuit of crinkled, reflective silver-gray material. Over this were attached a helmet, metal gauntlets, boots— a mechanical rig held against his back by two straps, crossing in an X-pattern across his chest, and a broad belt holding pouches and a holster carrying an oversized blaster pistol. All these accoutrements had similar metallic surfaces, resembling brushed silver. The helmet was the one Jag had worn aboard Love Commander during the last engagement with Alima Rar, and the gauntlets were the crush gaunts sent by Boba Fett. Jaina scowled. Why is it I always catch you playing dress-up? Just assembling my gear. My current kit. Jag pushed up the visor of his helmet, revealing his eyes and the bridge of his nose. 
Jaina approached and wrapped her knuckles against his chest. It rang, the noise dulled by the cloth covering it. And the breastplate, too. Not exactly the height of fashion, is it? Well, I'll forgive you for wearing too much shiny stuff, if it's useful. Oh, it's all useful. Jag tapped each item in turn as he explained. You're familiar with the helmet, the breastplate, and the crush gaunts. Jaina nodded. The backpack is a thruster. It's not much use in Coruscant-level gravity, but in low-grav conditions, it will get me around, help make up for the fact that I can't do Jedi leaps. The blaster pistol I designed from the ground up. He drew it and managed a creditable Han Solo spin around his trigger finger, despite the presence of his crush gaunts. It's oversized, so I can draw and fire it while wearing the gauntlets. It's engineered to function in the temperatures and vacuum of deep space. I can fire it while extravehicular. He holstered it again. Plus, it has a feature I don't think any blaster has ever had. What's that? He shook his head, and the bridge of his nose crinkled. Jaina guessed that he was grinning at her. She felt a flash of annoyance, but let it pass. All right, keep your little boy's secret— he gestured at the material of his flight suit. Laced with cortosis alloy. Not much. With the temple and the academy of Asis both abandoned, Master Luke could supply me with only a little. But a little still means that a graze from a lightsaber could result in minor or no damage instead of an amputation. The belt pouches, full of surprises for Alima. The boots... His voice trailed off. Yes? Keep me from stubbing my toes. She sighed. Funny. Or not. She looked over his battle array. How long have you been working on this? I've been carrying pieces of it for years, gradually adding items as I learned more about our quarry. He shrugged. His entire torso rose as one piece. It doesn't make me a Jedi, but we don't need another Jedi. We need something she can't predict. Also, if I take the crush gaunts off, I can pilot a starfighter in this. The suit offers all the usual virtues of a flight suit. Well, I have something your suit doesn't have. From her belt, she extracted a piece of flimsy and held it up before Jag's eyes. He focused on the astronomical coordinates written on it. Is that what I hope it is? Probable coordinates for Brisha Sio's habitat. Care to go there and have a picnic? Definitely. You tell the tall fellow with half a name. Should I invite your parents? Jaina nodded. I think they have a right to be there. Aboard the Anakin Solo. Alana's breath came in gasps, and she rolled over in her bed. Her eyes closed, her face flushed. In his chair beside her, Kytus winced. The nightmares had come again for her. It had been two days since her collapse, and she'd alternated between deep sleep and troubled dreams. The medical droid had said it was a not unusual reaction to emotional trauma, but those dispassionate words did nothing to ease the pain Kaidas felt. Then Alana's eyes opened. She looked around, confused, trying to make sense of her surroundings, and caught sight of Kaidas. She drew away from him, huddling against the wall. She reached for her thigh, her hand coming up with the injector pen her mother had given her long ago the self-defense weapon with which she had once subdued a dangerous assassin. She was brandishing it against him, her own father. And Kytus felt a pain as sharp as if she had plunged it straight into his heart. Emotion made his voice hoarse. Good morning, Alana. I'm glad you're feeling better. 
she lowered the injector, but did not return it to its hideaway sheath. I want to go home. This has to be your home for the time being. You're safer here than anywhere. She shook her head. I'm safest with Mommy. Bad people keep coming for you when you're with your mother. You need to be here. They all died, didn't they? Titus nodded. Many people died. And though I tried to get you far away from them, I couldn't get far enough away. You were... Alana struggled for the words. You were bad. I hate you. Another stab to his heart. No, you don't. You can't hate someone who loves you. I love you, Alana. No, you don't. You took me away from Mommy. You said you had permission, and you lied. You're the same as anyone else who wants to hurt me. I hate you! She raised the injector again. No. Alana, you can't. It's not possible. And I'll tell you why. Kytus remained in his chair by force of will. Every instinct made him want to hold the little girl, to comfort her. Every instinct but the one that told him she needed to be free to decide, free to act. You're right, that I took you without permission. But I don't need permission. Yes, you do. No, I don't. I'll tell you why, and you'll believe me, because I can't lie to you about this. You'd know it if I lied. All you have to do is open up your heart, and you'll know how I feel. You'll know the truth. Defiant, she kept her injector at the ready. Her expression dared him to reach for her. Alana, Tenel Ka has the right to decide where you go, and what you learn, and how you are to be protected. And she has that right, because she's your mommy. She has had that right for all your life so far. I have the same right. Because I'm your daddy. Alana froze, her expression transforming from defiant to unbelieving. She shook her head. Kaidus waited, pouring his love for her into the force, trying to send it through his eyes into hers. He nodded. You always knew you had a daddy. Your mommy had to keep who it was a secret. But now, you're old enough to understand it. I'm your daddy. He felt the fear within her, the lingering pain from the events of two days earlier, begin to erode. Alana lowered her injector. Through the Force, he offered her nothing but the truth. For the first time in months, perhaps years, there was nothing of Sith training to his thoughts, nothing of the Jedi, no strategy, no planning. There was only what he felt. She came to him, clambering over the bed and into his lap. She put her arms around his neck. Daddy. Yes. Your daddy. Forever and ever. He held her to him, stroked her hair. And when the war is over, and the bad people have been taught how wrong they were, and everyone is happy again, 
we can tell everyone that I'm your daddy. And you can sit right next to me and help me decide how things are going to be for everyone. Won't that be nice? Korriban, World of the Sith On a ruin of a planet, they stood in the ruins of a citadel, themselves the ruins of an ancient organization, the Sith Order. In a circular meeting chamber, its stone walls darkened by age and weathering, they stood in a circle, dark hooded robes obscuring their identities. It was an unnecessary precaution. There was no one present who was not part of their order, but legends and records had taught them the merits of caution, of maintaining customs of secrecy and self-preservation even when in their safest havens. One of them, a dark-skinned human female, whose pale, geometric-patterned tattoos stood out in sharp relief on the skin of her cheeks, bowed to the assembly. Her voice was surprisingly light and musical, considering her somber appearance, as she answered the question put to her. Yes, my lord. I have news, and even speculation, concerning Alimarar. We will hear them, Dishan. The words came from the man guiding this conclave, a human whose fully white eyes suggested blindness, but whose alert mannerisms said otherwise. Dishan continued. The Erzat's Sith holocron provided to her traced her path back to her point of origin, it is an asteroid belt in a star system near Bimiel. When a cloaked ship comes available, I will requisition its use to pinpoint her location exactly. The white-eyed leader's voice suggested skepticism. You think her significant enough to devote important resources to such a mission? I do. Why? Dishan took a long breath, a delaying tactic, allowing her a few more seconds to compose her argument. By offering the Jedi aid in their search for this woman, a buzz of offended comments from the others brought her up short. She glanced around, assessing the mood of the assembly, and decided that she would lose respect if she yielded to their outrage. Before the white-eyed man could bring them to order, she continued, her voice rising to cut through their complaints. In one of my assumed identities, of course, as a Confederation intelligence operative, I would not aid the Jedi, but they must think of me as an ally. The others quieted. And having proved myself a legitimate intel officer, I received a considerable amount of information on their hunt for a Limarar, which must necessarily include information and speculation about her. It seems that among the resources she inherited from Lumia is a force technique permitting her the projection of phantoms across space. It appears in every way to match the lost technique of Darth Vectivus. At those words, the murmur rose again. Vectivus's history is clear. He was a fraud. Someone muttered. A fraud with an art that would benefit us all, said someone else. I was not here for her visit. Could this Alimarar be turned to our ends? Yet a third questioned. I think not. She seemed as insane as a piranha beetle with a needle through its brain. The voice was barely audible above the other voices. The white-eyed man cleared his throat, and the others went silent. We must recapture the woman, extract the secrets of the technique from her, and seize the power source she utilizes. There was regret in Dishan's tone as she replied. I think not, my lord. 
the Jedi are now homing in on her location. Knowledge is much easier to obtain than to contain. Once they know where her base is, we will never be able to preserve that secret. The white-eyed man considered. Very well. You were correct, Dishon. This is of highest priority. We will not concern ourselves with a cloaked ship, but assign a fully armed warship to the task. I am recalling the poison moon and assigning it to you for this mission. It will be equipped with explosives sufficient to destroy an asteroid. You will use it to locate the dark side energy source used to power Vectivus's force phantom technique and obliterate it. You will obtain any Sith artifacts in Alimarar's possession. You will also capture Alimarar. Or, if circumstances warrant, kill her. Dishan bowed again. It will be my pleasure. Sanctuary Moon of Endor They made a curious parade, Luke decided. Not that he hadn't been part of many curious parades in the course of his curious life. First went the Hapen Security Vanguard. Four spectacular-looking women. They wore the most stylish body armor imaginable, its graceful lines broken up by green and brown camouflage patterns that made the armor difficult to pick out amid Endor's forest vegetation. Behind the security guard by some ten meters, walking side by side, came Luke and Queen Mother Tenel Ka, dressed completely inappropriately for their surroundings— Luke wearing his black Jedi Grand Master garments, Tenel Ka sporting a flowing gown in shimmering metallic shades of blue. Luke suspected that beneath it, Tenel Ka probably wore traditional Dathomiri battle dress. But he would never know unless an attack was staged against them and she felt the need to move freely. Ten meters farther back were the droids C-3PO and R2-D2 the former to deal with any Ewoks who might approach, and the latter, in as much as any droid could, representing a comfortable and friendly face for Tenel Ka. The main body of the Odd Safari walked behind the droids, Jedi Masters Saba Sebatine and Silgal, along with half a dozen advisors to the Queen Mother. At the rear of the party were four more Hapen security specialists, Luke pitched his voice as a whisper. Quite a retinue for a little walk in the woods. How many do you have to take with you when you just want to go to the refresher? Tenel Ka had not smiled in the brief time since her arrival on Endor, but she almost did now. Almost. To Luke it seemed that the facial muscles that permitted such an expression no longer knew how to perform. Her whispered answer was matter-of-fact. In my own palace, none. In foreign palaces, a minimum of four. And if you're visiting Dathomir, where the only thing available is a bush? It's the best defended bush within a dozen parsecs. I thought so. They walked in silence for a little while. Luke could feel the tension within Tenel Ka. It roiled at the surface of her thoughts, like water just beginning to boil, but he did not feel it appropriate to hurry her toward the conversation to come. Tenel Ka waited until they found a broad clearing. At its center was a wide, nearly flat stone, some four meters across, the only spot of the clearing visited by shafts of sunlight. She raised her voice so that all could hear. This will do. As she and Luke moved toward the stone, her guards scattered, forming a defensive perimeter around the clearing, while the Jedi Masters, Hapen Advisors, and Droids stood in a tight knot well away from its center. 
Luke sat at one edge of the stone. It was warm under him, even compared with the warmth of the forest air. He extended his senses through the force to seek out any intelligences that might be close enough to listen, and found none, except for Tenel Ka, who was doing just as he was. She finally sat next to him. One of the problems with dealing with Jedi Masters is that they're so patient. It's enough to drive you crazy. They just wait you out. Remembering his own time on Dagobah with Master Yoda, Luke nodded. You're right. Now I've become exactly what used to make me insane with frustration. I wonder when that happened. Tenel Ka took a deep breath. You know that I turned my back on the Alliance, demanding that Jason be removed from power. Then I withdrew from the war altogether, and did not pursue my agenda against Jason any longer. Yes. I assumed you had a good reason. That was the truth. Luke felt no anger or censure. Tenel Ka was the Queen Mother. She would not have wavered on this matter without cause. I don't know if it's a good reason. It's a very personal reason. Jason kidnapped my daughter, Alana. He threatened to kill her if I did not resume my duties as an Alliance member. Luke winced. I wish I could say I was surprised. He almost added he kidnapped Ben, too, and tortured him, but he clamped down on the words before they left him. Tenel Ka did not need to experience mental images of Jason torturing Alana. She did not need the additional fear and worry his words would cause. I thought, I think, that he could probably do it. Kill my baby. The situation cut me in two. The Queen Mother arguing one course of action, Alana's mother arguing another. Alana's mother won. I understand. But after what happened a few days ago, the firing of Centerpoint Station, Tenel Ka's voice wavered. Luke could feel her anguish growing within the Force, and, detecting her distress, Saba and Silgal glanced over at the two of them. It shows the ends the Confederation is willing to go to. It shows how insane this war has become. The Hapes Consortium has been rebuilding for more than fifteen years from the damage caused the last time the station was fired. The Corellians can use it to destroy whole worlds, if they want. Luke nodded. A while back, I thought that Alana and I could perhaps run away. They'd hunt us down, of course. The Alliance, or my political opponents from Hapes. Alana and I would die. But we'd die together, in each other's arms. Now it looks like we won't even have that tiny comfort. We're going to die, never having seen each other again. You don't know that. If you saw something like that as a force vision, it isn't necessarily the true future. I don't see visions of the future anymore. Not really. I just feel death and failure all around us consuming us like a fire. Tenel Ka looked down at her hand, resting palm up in her lap. It twitched, and Luke sensed she longed for her lightsaber to be there, lit, with enemies in front of her, enemies she could attack personally, physically. I have to be the Queen Mother, Master Skywalker. I have to decide what's right for my people. Yes. I have to turn my fleets against the evil Jason represents. 
And then I have to watch him kill my baby. An overpowering wave of grief rolled off Tenelka. Luke almost reached for her to comfort her, but in the sight of so many others, such a gesture would be utterly inappropriate. He saw Silgal take an involuntary step toward them, but the moan cal healer caught herself and stepped back again. Has your intelligence service determined where Alana is? To stage a rescue? They don't have to. I can feel her. Sometimes she's on Coruscant. Sometimes elsewhere. Her movements match those of the Anakin Solo. The events of just a few days earlier clicked together in Luke's thoughts. The little girl Jason had been using as a human shield. That had to have been Alana. Luke decided not to mention it. A grief-stricken queen mother is of no more use to the Hapens than a grief-stricken Jedi is to the Order. What if we just go in and retrieve Alana for you? She looked at him, a new dread in her eyes. This time, an unwillingness to let herself hope for something so tremendous. If I thought it could be done, I'd have done it already. One former Jedi and limitless wealth can accomplish a lot of things. Luke's gesture took in all of the Sanctuary Moon, back to his outpost and beyond. A whole order of Jedi can accomplish other things. I couldn't ask you to. And you didn't. But I think it's the right thing to do. The right thing from a personal and military point of view. Without Alana, Jason loses his influence over the Consortium. With the revelation of his threat to kill Alana, Admiral Neothel may reconsider her alliance with Jason. With the odds shifted away from the Alliance, Jason and Neothel may have to sue for peace. Rescuing Alana could end this war, Tenelka. He offered his hand to her. The Jedi Order offers. Slowly, as if not daring to believe her luck, Tenelka took it. The Hapes Consortium accepts. With gratitude. Chapter 23 Star System MZX-32905 Near Bimiel The Millennium Falcon dropped out of hyperspace well outside the asteroid belt of Star System MZX-32905, well away from the floating, tumbling hazards to navigation its asteroids constituted. Han and Leia could see the belt on their sensors, though, as a broad line of irregular lumps, demonstrating widely different masses, shapes, and rotations. A moment later, a starfighter appeared nearby, trailing the Falcon by a few dozen kilometers. Jag's X-Wing. This meant that Jaina and Zex's stealth X's were there as well. Han didn't bother searching for them on his sensors. He might pick up traces, but it would be a pointless exercise. Leia activated the comm board, adjusted the transmission to its lowest power setting, and directed it precisely toward Jag's starfighter. We've begun the passive sensor scan, and we're running computations on all observable asteroids of the appropriate size, plotting their locations when Jason and Ben visited. She didn't get a word or click in response, but hadn't expected one. She could feel Jaina and the other two in the force, and knew them to be patient, unalarmed, waiting. They had to be receiving her. Han watched as data began accumulating on his sensor board. Red shapes, each one designated with an alphanumeric code decided on by the Falcon's navigational computer, indicated where the relevant asteroids were now. 
yellowish shapes with corresponding designations began appearing, showing where those asteroids had been many months earlier. Han adjusted the scale of the sensor image to display the system's entire asteroid belt. I'm going to prioritize these targets so we can figure out what order we visit them in. Leia gave him a dubious look. Based on your extensive knowledge of ore yields and mining techniques, I suppose. Of course not. Based on my knowledge of how corporate stiffs think. For instance, they like big round things. So we'll focus on the biggest, roundest asteroids first. Leia put her head down in her hands. That wouldn't hurt so much if I didn't suspect you were right. Lumia's Satellite Habitat Alima felt a little ripple in the force. It was of no more consequence than if a normal person had had a dream in which a menacing shape stood over her bed as she slept. But Alima had long ago learned to trust incidents that seemed to be of little consequence. She threw off her bedsheet and rose, then dressed hurriedly, as hurriedly as a being could with only one working arm. The habitat was silent, except for the hiss of atmosphere conditioners. Her chambers, rooms that had once been Lumia's, were dimly lit by night-intensity glow rods and held no terrors for her while she was awake. Casting out in the force, she could feel nothing but the beautiful, malevolent furnace of power hundreds of meters beneath her, the wellspring of energy with which she would someday be able to balance the galaxy. There was nothing to cause the ripple she had felt, but she had felt it. She took one of the few working turbo lifts up to the habitat's top level, the observatory, with its curved shelves full of artifacts and its transparent steel dome facing the stars. Reclining on a comfortable sofa, she relaxed into the force, seeking any hint, any anomaly that would explain what she had felt. It was at times like this that the vast amount of dark side power down below was an impediment instead of a blessing. Like a racing thruster engine, it offered many resources, but tended to drown out all lesser noises around it. Then she felt it again, the ripple. Someone was hunting her. Someone was here to kill her. She smiled. She had been hunted many times. But this was the first time she had ever been hunted in a place where she made the rules. All. The Rules Aboard the frigate Poison Moon Dishon stared through the bridge's forward viewports, which offered a view of stars, and irregular black patches obscuring expanses of stars. The black patches, she knew, were the largest of the asteroids in this field, receiving little or none of the light from this system's sun. Navigating an asteroid field in a 150-meter-long frigate using only passive sensors was not the easiest of tasks. Dishon did not unnecessarily intrude on the concentration of Wainus, her chief pilot. A male human, gray-haired and bearded, Wainus was an aging pirate and smuggler who knew nothing of the Force, and who would have reacted incuriously to the news that his commander was a member of the Sith Order. He gave good value for his pay, and remained loyal so long as the credits kept coming, making him reliable and predictable. Dishon approved of him. Now Wainus tapped a command sequence into his keyboard. The main bridge monitor, just above the forward viewports, darkened into a view of the starfield before them, then began zooming. Moments later, it displayed a view heavily pixelated at extreme magnification, of a roughly spherical asteroid, visible only as a crescent of faint sunlight. Wainus looked up to catch Dishon's attention. Your target, Captain, confirmed as the source of your tracer transmissions. Excellent. 
plot a course to the vicinity of that asteroid. Keep other asteroids between it and us as long as possible. I want little or no direct line of sight on us. Stealth approach. Understood. Wainus turned back to his keyboard and began plotting out the complicated approach. Sensor reading? That was Ithila, the Poison Moon's sensor officer. A heapen woman of middle years, she was lean and beautiful. But for the pattern of livid burn scars that crisscrossed the right side of her face, the result of an explosion aboard a battle dragon during the Yuzhan Vong War, an allergy to Bacta had prevented her from eliminating the scars, and the heapen cultural revulsion for anything damaged had sent Ithela into self-imposed exile. Dishon cleared her throat. Perhaps some more information would be in order. Ithela glanced at her captain, evidently trying to gauge whether Dishon was being polite or sarcastic. Two targets, too far away for a visual reading. Neither one has a transponder active... Fuel emission sensor readings suggest one is a starfighter, and the other is in the class of a yacht or light freighter. The starfighter is approaching our target asteroid. The other vehicle is staying on station a hundred kilometers or so from our target. Dishon considered, drumming her fingers on the armrest of her captain's chair. Sneaking up on a rogue Jedi in an antiquated frigate was tricky enough without the complication of additional observers. Still, it had to be done. Continue as ordered. However, we may have to make a fast run from the final asteroid to our target. I want all crews and asteroid buster bombs standing by at the shuttles. I want all weapons primed and ready. Wainus nodded, unperturbed. Yes, Captain. Jag took the lead in his X-Wing. It was only fitting, because of the three starfighters, his was the only one not equipped for stealth. Jaina and Zek hung back in their stealth X's as Jag approached the habitat. Squat and dome-topped, Set atop plascrete columns holding it meters above the asteroid surface, archaic of design and pitted with meteorite strikes sustained across centuries, it exactly matched the habitat described in Ben Skywalker's report of the Brescia Sio encounter. Jag brought his vehicle in quickly enough that he could accelerate away at a good clip if weapons turrets suddenly sprouted on the habitat's surface. But the habitat remained inert and he felt a moment of doubt. Was Alima even there? Leia's last tight-beam transmission minutes earlier had indicated that she had felt some movement in the Force, something distinct from the pool of dark energy waiting at the asteroid's center. But that didn't mean their quarry was home. Well, if she wasn't, her hunters could take up residence and wait for her. His X-Wing comm board reported a signal an automated query from a hangar facility offering landing instructions. He ignored it. He decelerated as he neared the habitat. In the dim light from the distant sun, it was revealed to be an unlovely mass of reinforced duracrete, its viewports dark, perhaps covered by durasteel meteorite shutters. He sent his X-Wing into a shallow dive, activating repulsor lifts as he came within meters of the stony asteroid surface, and glided in underneath the habitat, between its support pillars. A column of light emerged from the center of the habitat's underside, illuminating a section of railed track. The track led down to the asteroid surface, and into it, through a broad gash in the stone. Jag nodded. The light had to come from the chamber described in Ben Skywalker's report, a room that housed the rail car access to the mines below. The hatch into the chamber was open, with the chamber's air probably being contained by atmosphere shielding. Not that the presence or lack of atmosphere mattered to him. Not now. 
he set his X-wing down almost directly beneath the chamber opening, and powered down. Then, bypassing warning indicators and programming implemented to prevent accidents, he raised his canopy, venting his cockpit atmosphere into space. He pulled his crush gaunts from the webbing that kept them secure at his feet, donned them, then unstrapped and activated his low-grav thruster pack. This would be a tricky maneuver. He had to fly up into the lit chamber, which was simple enough, but if the habitat's artificial gravity was active, and he calculated his angle and rate of travel wrong, he would immediately be dragged back through the hole again, or would hit the chamber ceiling and carry him to an inglorious crash somewhere on the chamber floor. As he reached the circular opening and emerged into light, he cut his thruster and drew his oversized blaster. His momentum carried him a couple of meters into the air. Curved wall ahead of him, no targets visible. He came down on his feet on solid flooring and spun, assessing possible threats, possible targets. Track protruding nearly up to the high ceiling. A control stand. No rail car, doors, no Alimarar. Breathing hard, he took another turn around, confirming that there were no threats at hand. Excellent. He was in. On the other hand, there had been no one there to see his flashy arrival. He shrugged and holstered his blaster. He'd just have to do it again sometime when he had an audience. Jaina and Zek, their stealth exes side by side and mere meters apart, saw the hangar's blast doors begin to slide open, revealing a large, lit chamber beyond, and Jag fell standing at one door edge, waving them in. Jaina goosed her thruster and glided forward, Zack pacing her. As they approached, Jag waved downward, indicating a litter of items on the floor just inside the door. Jaina saw barrels, wires, electronic components— Jag held up his hands together, then spread them, miming the effects of an explosion. Jaina nodded. So Alima had left them a trap. A bomb. What looked like an improvised bomb. If it was improvised, the odds were improved that Alima Rar was still here, or had only recently fled. The Jedi set their vehicles down in the center of the hangar slowly spinning them on repulsor lifts so they faced the doors and came to a full landing. Jag shut the outer doors and approached as they raised their canopies. His visor was up. Two bombs so far. He gestured toward the litter on the floor and toward the edge of the door where it rested on its guiding rail. There Jaina saw more electronic components. Simple ones thrown together but no Sith ship. Jaina rolled out of her cockpit and dropped to the floor. There was something malevolent about this hangar, something different from the energy that suffused this place, a different flavor. She searched for it in the Force and found it nearby, a loathing mixed with patience, anger mixed with servility. Whatever its source was, it had recently rested against a nearby wall and had left only minutes before. Disappointment weighed down on her. She's fled. Zack moved up to join them. He shook his head. No, she hasn't. Can't you feel it? With a pointing finger, he traced a path from the corner where that patient loathing had waited, out through the hangar doors, and then down. Straight down into the asteroid. Now Jaina could feel it, could follow that trail. The vehicle, for it had to be Alima's Sith craft, had been here until recently, then had been flown down through the rift in the asteroid surface. Alima and her craft waited far below. Jag shrugged. She knows we're here. Scratch off the element of surprise— We'll just have to show her some other surprises. Problem is, though the habitat is pressurized and the caverns are, 
there's about a 15-meter gap of hard vacuum between the two. Not a problem. Jaina drew her Jedi cloak around her. We have the equivalent of flight suits on under our robes. With flight helmets, or with our emergency masks, we can survive several minutes' worth of hard vacuum. Jag flipped his visor shut. His next words, through the helmet's speaker, were amplified rather than muffled. Let's go, then! Let's end this! Aboard the Poison Moon It's a Corellian light freighter. The disc shape is distinctive. Dishon, jolted by Ithella's words, looked at her sensor officer. The Poison Moon had crept closer by several asteroids to the habitat location, and now the sensors could pick up the habitat building itself, and details of the other vehicle that waited nearby. Dishon's mouth went dry. Compare the vehicle's distinctive markings and modifications with known records of the Millennium Falcon. Yes. There were hundreds or thousands of Corellian YT-1300 light freighters still in service around the galaxy. But one, and only one, had a vastly increased likelihood, a greater statistical probability, of showing up wherever trouble was brewing. With growing impatience, she waited while Ithella tapped her way through a series of screens. Then Ithella looked up, her expression startled. It's a match, Captain. Certainty exceeds ninety-eight percent. Dishon took a deep breath. The Falcon, especially if it was captained by Han Solo, would be quite a prize, captured or destroyed. The bragging rights alone for having killed Solo for ridding the galaxy of his interference, would keep Dishon warm for decades. And the pleasure would be doubled if Leia Organa Solo, Jedi and traitor to the noble Sith name of Skywalker, was aboard. Dishon struggled to keep her tone normal. No mistakes now. We have double the Falcon's firepower and the element of surprise— but none of that means anything if we make a mistake. So we will continue our approach, and we will be perfect. We will make our run on the Falcon, and we will be perfect. We will launch our crews to raid the habitat and situate the bombs on the asteroid, and we will be... What will we be? The bridge crew members offered their answer in unison. Perfect. That's right. Perfect. Perfect. Leia rubbed the back of her neck. Han glanced her way. What? What, what? You said perfect. As in something's really perfect? Or something's very messed up? I don't really mean it's perfect. Leia shook her head. I don't know. The second one, I guess. She returned her attention to the sensor board. Nothing had changed since she'd seen the habitat's hangar door close. Nothing would change until her daughter, Zek, and Jag emerged. But a nagging thought told her she really needed to keep her attention there. Then she felt it a pulse in the force, a distant query from the direction of the asteroid. Flavored with the darkness that inhabited that place, but distinctly the presence of Alima Rar, it reached out for her, brushed over her, went elsewhere. Leia stiffened. Alima's found us. She unstrapped and rose from the co-pilot seat, taking her lightsaber in hand. And if we've guessed right about the way she operates now, Han nodded glumly. She'll conjure up a force phantom and send it against us. Leia turned to face the cockpit entrance. Ready. 
Chapter 24 Jag leapt up, high above the opening in the floor, and dropped through into hard vacuum. Passing through the area of the habitat's artificial gravity, he slowed in his descent, but continued downward, the metal crack close by, into the deeper darkness of the large gash in the asteroid surface below. He thought he could feel his feet hit the atmosphere containment field there. Whether he could or not, he felt his rate of descent slow further as he encountered the friction of atmosphere. I'm in. He cycled through his helmet sensors. The basic sensors showed cavern walls all around, at distances of thirty to a hundred meters. There were a few faint gleams from glow rods on the metal rails. Other than that, all was dark. You're going to need some lights. A moment later, his sensors showed Jaina and Zek dropping feet first after him. They held lit glow rods, so he could see them with his naked eyes as well. The glow rod light reflected from the irregular surfaces of the transparasteel foil masks they wore for their brief exposure to hard vacuum. Jaina's voice crackled in his ear. We just felt her reaching out for us. Jaina and Zek vectored in their slow freefall an act that would be impossible for normal people, but Jag assumed they simply used the force to shove themselves laterally. The maneuver allowed them to drift to within reach of the metal track. They did not grab it, but occasionally reached out a hand or foot to brush against it, directing them smoothly down its length. Jag touched his thruster pack to slow himself to their descent rate. There was something on his sensors— something big but indistinct on the far side of the widest part of this cavern. Jag rotated and pointed in that direction, alerting the others. It rushed toward them, streaming through the air, growing more distinct as it came. A flock of Minox. Aboard the Millennium Falcon. A thump against the Falcon's cockpit viewport prompted Leia to turn forward again. There was something outside the viewport, resting against it, a gray, fleshy mass with an enormous gaping mouth full of sharp teeth. Han stared back at the thing, unruffled. My knock, sweetheart. Give me a minute, I'll burn him off. He began typing in the commands Leia knew would send electric currents through the Falcon's outer hull. Wait! Leia reached out through the force toward the Minoc. As she did so, it looked away from Han, straight at her. In the Force, it was her husband. Leia gulped. Burn that, and you burn yourself. That Minoc is a Force phantom. And it's you. Han looked outraged. A Minoc? Kill me, sure. But does she have to insult me? Han... Hang on, princess. If I can't burn it off, I'll shake it off. As Leia grabbed for the back of her chair, Han hit the thrusters. The sudden acceleration nearly took Leia off her feet, then ended abruptly as Han hit the retros, slamming Leia forward into the back of her chair. The Minoc hurtled forward as if catapulted from the Falcon's cockpit. A few dozen meters away, it spread its leather arm wings and banked as if flying in atmosphere, wheeling around back toward them. Aboard the Poison Moon The Falcon is maneuvering. Dishon gave Ithella a nod and returned her attention to the forward monitor. It showed the Corellian freighter whirling in place, then accelerating away from the asteroid and then, just as abruptly, vectoring to starboard. Dishon cocked her head. It looked as though the Falcon were engaged in a dogfight, but no opponent appeared on the sensor board. This was the second inexplicable event in just a few moments. Less than a minute earlier, Dishon had felt something brush against her in the Force. That presence had moved on, seeming to settle elsewhere on the Poison Moon settling everywhere at once, as far as she could tell, but not doing anything. And now this. 
Wainis seemed unperturbed. Orders, Captain? They were now mostly shielded behind the last large asteroid positioned between them and the habitat. It wasn't all that large. If the Millennium Falcon's curious acrobatics took her farther and farther in random directions, she would inevitably detect the frigate. Wait until the Falcon is oriented away from us, on one of her maneuvers. Then begin your run. The instant I determine that the Falcon has detected us, I'll issue the command, Go. This means all weapons open fire on the Falcon. All shuttles launch. Instantly. Yes, Captain. What are we? Perfect, Captain. That's right. The stream of Minox, twenty at least, flew straight at Jaina and her companions. She reached out in the force to find them, and felt incongruously complex presences instead. One of them, the lead Minoc, was unmistakably Jag, or at least bore his unique signature in the force. The rest were unfamiliar to her, but definitely more complex, more alive in the force than Minox. They're all phantoms. One of them is you, Jag. She got a grunt of confirmation. The lead Minoc flew straight at Jag. He hit his thruster and twisted aside. The digits at the end of its right wing arm, grasping at him, missed him by a meter. Its lashing tail missed him by centimeters. Jag maintained his lateral thruster burn, carrying him away from the Minox and the Jedi. Most of the Minox followed him. Four veered toward the Jedi, a flyby attack made with lashing tails. Jaina and Zek got their hands on the metal track and had no difficulty twisting out of harm's way as the Minox attacked and passed. Jag's voice was calm, unrattled. Keep going. I'll lead these away. We'll divide Alima's concentration, see if we can overload her. Be careful. With an exertion in the force, Jaina pushed herself downward, causing her to slide much faster down the track. Zek followed. The last four Minox didn't. They wheeled for a moment, then took off after Jag. The light from their glow rods showed the track passing through a hole in the cavern floor, leading into another, deeper chamber. Aboard the Millennium Falcon Han spun the Falcon, a barrel roll that would have made it next to impossible for a real Minoc to reattach itself to her hull. But he lost sight of the creature by eye and by sensor, and wondered if it had managed to clamp onto the hull despite his maneuvers. Leia gripped the back of her chair in a ferocious Wookiee hug and glared at him. Remind me why I ever unstrap myself while I'm aboard this crate? Because you're still looking for thrills. That's why you're still with me. Where's the Minox, sweetheart? Leia's face cleared as she searched in the force. Then her expression began to change to one of alarm. Incoming fight. Han put the falcon into another gymnastic tumble, even as he saw Leia's expression alter. Lances of light glared by outside as linked turbo lasers fired on them. Where'd she come from? On Han's sensor board, closing fast, was a small capital ship. An interceptor-class frigate, to judge from her elongated spar of a body, broadened chisel-shaped bow and blocky stern. As Han watched, thruster flares lit from the flanks and top hull of the frigate, and shuttles of several different vehicle classes launched, angling away from the frigate, away from the Falcon, toward the asteroid. Interceptors weren't much by capital ship standards, but they carried more turbo lasers than the Falcon, proton torpedoes instead of concussion missiles, heavier armor, heavier shields, the Falcon was outclassed. But Han was not going to leave, not with his daughter still prowling around the depths of the asteroid away from her stealth X. I don't know, 
Where's the Minoc? Han felt a sudden chill. If the Minoc phantom linked to him wandered into the path of the frigate's turbo lasers, the attack would kill him as dead as any other. I don't know. Gone. In a brief moment of straight-line travel, Leia got to the front of her chair and hopped into it, facing backward to forestall any sneak attack from that direction, and resumed her death grip on the seat back. Oh, now it's back again. It was then that Alima Rar's voice floated sweet and mocking from deep within the falcon. Han? Han Solo? The attack came as Jaina and Zek shot down through the hole into the next cavern. It was not signaled by any disturbance in the force. Inert lumps on the rim of the hole into the cavern suddenly erupted into movement, became bipedal figures swinging two-meter clubs. Reflexively, Jaina lit her lightsaber and parried. Her blow severed the club, revealing it to be a length of durasteel rail three or four centimeters in diameter. Her attacker was a protocol droid, sky blue, of ancient design and manufacture. Jaina hurtled past it. She heard a pained oof and looked up to see Zek meters above her, descending more slowly. His attacker's rail was pinned under his left arm. His attacker, a scarlet protocol droid, still held the other end. They floated in Jaina's wake, slowed by the fact that what had been Zek's downward kinetic energy was now divided between them. Sorry, Zek twisted, and then he was a meter away from the track, his attacker right next to it. As Jaina watched, the protocol droid's head began banging against every cross tie on the track, causing the head to bounce back and forth. The additional impacts and friction slowed Zek still more, causing him to drop farther behind. Thought it might have been a force phantom. Didn't attack it before it hit me. Are you hurt? A couple of ribs cracked, I think. Not too bad. It sounded worse than that. Zek's breathing was labored. The red droid's head came off. The rest of its body went limp. Zek gestured, and both it and the metal rail went flying off into the darkness. Jaina returned her attention to her surroundings. Things weren't too bad. Ali Marar had enjoyed plenty of time to work up surprises for unwanted visitors, and so far nothing had been too strange or difficult for her hunters. The theory they'd developed concerning her force phantoms and their limitations seemed to be proving true. On Kashyyyk and here, none had demonstrated an ability to project damage at range, as with a blaster. The phantoms seemed to be contained, confined to the limits of the bodies they simulated. Some could wield lightsabers, but that made a certain amount of sense, as the Jedi regarded their lightsabers as extensions of themselves. This might work. This attack might just work. Then Jaina felt a pulse of malevolence, followed by something approaching her, something too massive for her to deflect, moving too fast for her to dodge. The stream of Minox flitted by Jag, passing within meters, their angry eyes fixed on him. Several flicked their tails at him. Two swooped close enough to be real threats. He raised his left arm, caught a tail end across his crush gaunt. The blow did not scar the metal. With his right hand he missed the other tail. It lashed across his chest, cutting a razor-thin gash in his flight suit, but doing no harm to the Beskar breastplate beneath. The blows sent him tumbling through the air in the Minox wake. As much as he could, he bent toward the gash in his flight suit, clamping an arm across it as though he were injured. If anyone was watching— he needed to conceal the presence of his armor as much as possible. The Minox wheeled in unison. His blaster hand twitched, every instinct telling him to draw and fire. But they flew past too quickly. When they swept by again, 
he blocked three tail lashes before they were passed, and then felt a jerk as a fourth tail, grappling rather than lashing, wrapped around his left ankle and towed him along in the Minox wake. The flock dived, heading toward a narrow gap in the cavern floor far away from the rail track. Jag gritted his teeth. He was doing his job. He was keeping these Minox off Jaina and Zek. If only he didn't hate this task quite so much. At the lowest level of the cavern complex, Ali Marar sat on the chamber's stone floor. A few meters ahead of her sat the rail car that provided access between this chamber, the habitat, and all caverns in between. It rested at the bottom of the track, angled upward. A few meters to her left was the entrance into Darth Vectivus's private cavern, the one in which he had built his ridiculous mansion so long ago. The stone door that could seal the chamber was open. The artificial gravity in the chamber was active, and even here, outside its main area of effect, Alima could feel it, providing her with what seemed to be about half Coruscant's gravity. She was already panting, tired by the effort of maintaining so many phantoms at once. She didn't think she could handle much more gravity than that unless she drew continually on the power of this place, which would have other consequences. How had Lumia accomplished what she had with the phantoms? With years of practice and tremendous will, Alima decided. She felt a little better. It was time to return to the war, to begin finishing off her intruders. Chapter 25 Descending in Jaina's wake, Zek felt the attack the instant Jaina did, felt its power and speed, and its intent. It was aimed at Jaina. Reflexively, Zek lashed out with the force, pushing. Jaina shot downward as if fired from an ancient artillery piece. Something flashed by a meter over her head, something silver. It severed the track there leaving a clean break in the metal rails. A fraction of a second later, it hit the far wall of the cavern with a dull flash of light and a resounding boom. Zek turned his attention toward the source of the attack. It was outside the range of his vision, but he could feel it now that it was on the offensive, no longer lying in wait. It had to be a hundred meters or more away though exact distances were difficult to predict through the Force. It reeked of dark side energy and intent, a Force presence that was at once unliving, but not inert. It had purpose. Zek could almost see it, reading its self-image, a large ball, webbed wings projecting from it, a weapon spike protruding from the top, a landing spike from its bottom and hatred for him, for Jaina, in what served it as a heart. Zek read its movements and intentions as it acted. Its top spike was aimed toward Jaina. Now it canted upward, aiming at Zek, and prepared to fire again. Zek grabbed the track with his free hand and pushed off, adding energy from the force to his movement, and hurtled downward. A fraction of a second later, Something flashed by over his head and sliced through the track there, then slammed into the far cavern wall. Cut above him and below him, several dozen meters worth of track floated free, twisting as it slowly began to accelerate downward. Zek grimaced. He was fighting a starfighter, or the equivalent of one, and all he had was his lightsaber. At least he could serve as a distraction keeping this thing off Jaina. As he reached the top of the remaining portion of track below, the spot where Jaina had almost been hit, he angled himself so that his feet came down on one of its cross ties. He took the slight shock of impact easily. Jaina, you go on. I can deal with this. How? Jaina's tone was flat, disbelieving. She knew he was lying. 
Don't distract me with questions. Just go. By dying, probably. He hoped that stray thought did not reach Jaina, that it had not crossed the faint remnants of the link they had shared since they had been joiners together years before. He felt Jaina's anger at him, at Ali Marar, but he felt, too, her acceptance. She knew it was the right thing to do. Divide Alima's concentration. Attack her on as many fronts as possible. The thing out in the darkness, the Sith ship, for so it had to be, drifted laterally, under power, perhaps trying to determine whether Zek could track it. Zek continued staring in the direction he had been originally. Then something occurred to him, and he grinned. Abandoning his Jedi detachment, he poured emotion into the Force, contempt for his enemy, disparaging dismissal of the Sith ship's worth. He felt his enemy's anger grow, and winced as it lashed out at him, grasping in the Force. But this was no attack. He could feel its thoughts now, primitive but clear, hammering away insistently at his mind like a fist against a door. He could almost understand them. He could understand them, he realized, if he wanted to. There was something familiar about their patterns, their darkness. Techniques he had learned years before, as a student of the Shadow Academy, gave him that insight. Though he had shoved them away deep into his memory, those techniques were still with him. If he chose to remember them. He wavered on the rung that supported him, and wavered on the question. But he had no time left. If the Sith starfighter killed him, it would go after Jaina next. He opened himself to the darkness. It flooded into him, engulfing him, gagging him. Abruptly, his surroundings were much clearer in his mind. The exact location— the appearance of that Sith meditation sphere, yes, that was what it was, were now clear to him, as were its thoughts. It hesitated in its movements, aware of the sudden change in Zek's outlook. You are Jedi. Am I? I have been many things. I was a Jedi a minute ago. What am I now? Not to be trusted. Zek let some amusement creep into his thoughts. And yet you trust her. He pictured Ali Marar in his mind, and let his memories of her as a young Jedi knight color his vision. The meditation sphere's reply was tinged with contempt. Not trust. Obey. Must obey. Because she knows a secret or two? Do you obey anything who knows the dark ways? You would obey me, then? The meditation sphere did not reply. A presentiment of victory, like adrenaline, flashed through Zek. That's it, isn't it? All you need is the right order. From the right Darksider. There was no answer. What are you called? I am ship. Zek snorted, amused and contemptuous at the same time. You are stupid and simplistic, but I will do you a favor anyway. I free you. He could tell that ship received his words, but he felt no indication of understanding. Of course not. This was a vehicle. It was made to serve. It would always serve. The question was, what would it serve? I free you from Ali Marar. I order you to leave her, to leave this place. I order you to find a master better suited to your nature. I command you to go as fast as you can, ignoring all commands, all cries for help. Into his words he poured his own power of will, and felt it joined, strengthened by the power of this dark place. 
His own strength swelled, bloating out beyond the confines of his body, growing like an explosion until its fringes engulfed Ship. There within Ship was a hard knot of resistance, older orders planted by Ali Marar. Zek saw them as a mound, like a standing stone. He lashed that stone with his own strength and saw it begin to erode, flaking away, dissolving. In moments it was gone, reduced to nothingness. Zek felt a sort of dark joy rise up within ship, and then the meditation sphere was accelerating upward, toward the exit out of the chamber. An instant later, it was gone. Zek sagged, relieved. Jaina would live. He would live. He would descend to where Ship knew Alima to be. Zek would kill Alima, cutting her until no remaining peace could sustain life. Then he would kill Jag and be rid of that moralistic interfering simulation of a man. That, of course, he would have to do in such a way that it did not distress Jaina. And finally, there would be Jaina. He would reforge the link between them, and through it pour his thoughts, his love. He would do so until she understood, until she loved and obeyed him, until she was his. Worry suddenly gnawed at him, like the sharp teeth of some undercity rodent. That's not... Right. Slowly, he lowered himself to sit on the top cross tie of the track, wrapping his legs around the rail for security. That's not what he should be thinking. The dark side was flooding him now, pouring its toxins into his thoughts. He tried to shove it out, to become what he had been just a few minutes before, but it was strong. So very strong, and it laughed at his pathetic efforts. Over the comlink, Jaina called for Zek, for Jag. She got no answer. That was not entirely unexpected. These personal comlinks could transmit across many kilometers, but not through stone nor thick duracrete and she had plummeted into yet another cavern chamber through a narrow passageway since parting from Zek. A touch of force exertion brought her alongside the track again. She put the soles of her boots against it, allowing friction to slow her. Alone, with only one set of eyes, she needed to descend more slowly, to be more alert, alert to presences in the force. She felt them off to her left. Then they were closer, moving into the range of her glow rod. The flock of Minox. The rearmost of them now towed Jag, who flailed helplessly. The foremost of them came on, tail lashing, and struck at her as it passed. She dodged the blow with minimal effort. The other Minox, strung out behind like a parade, wheeled in the first one's wake, preparing for one attack after another. Jaina snorted. Jag, stick out a hand as you pass. I'll pull you free. Jag didn't respond. His helmet comlink was probably out. That's an assumption. Whenever I make an assumption like that, you two are free to mock me mercilessly. The words were Jag's, but spoken long ago, during one of their many planning sessions and they were correct. She'd just made the sort of assumption that Jag himself routinely mocked. As she dodged the second Minoc attack, and the third, she cast out into the force to sense the figure being towed by the last Minoc. It was Jag, all right. Jaina worked the vertical rail track as a gymnast would a set of exercise bars, swinging her wide of every tail attack, or interposing the rails between her and an incoming tail, until only the last Minoc remained. Jag, in its grip, struggled and waved frantically at her. Jaina extended her hand to catch his, then yanked it back, 
allowing him to be towed past. As she did, Jag changed in form and dimension, becoming smaller, slighter. His outstretched hand suddenly had a blue-black lightsaber blade in it, and as Jaina pulled away, the blade crossed the spot where her torso had been. It cut a gash in the front of her robe, but did not catch the skin beneath. Abruptly, it was Alima Rar being towed, the young, unmaimed Alima, and she stared angrily at Jaina as she and her Minoc passed. Jaina grinned at them. Predictable, Alima. Predictable. The other Minox were suddenly gone, fading out of existence like the details of a dream in the moments after awakening. Alima swung up onto the last Minox back, riding it as she would a tauntaun. The creature circled, keeping Jaina and Alima safely out of range of each other. Alima's reply was similarly lighthearted. We wish to thank you for coming here and making it more convenient for us to kill you. Jaina shook her head. That's not what we're here for. We're going to end the threat you pose. You can die, or you can surrender. The choice is yours. You will never leave these chambers alive. Jaina shrugged. Neither will you. I'm prepared to die. Are you? Chapter 26 Aboard the Millennium Falcon Despite Han's maddening maneuvers with the Falcon, despite his frequent swearing and the way the Falcon shuddered whenever her shields sustained a hit from the pursuing frigate, Leia kept her attention on the doorway to the access corridor at the rear of the cockpit. And when the walls of the corridor began to glow, illuminated by a blue-black lightsaber blade that had to be just around the corridor. Leia leapt from her seat, moved to stand in the doorway, and lit her own blade. Alima stepped into view, again young and unmarred. She rushed Leia, throwing all her effort into a savage attack, all fourth-form technique without the added elements of acrobatics. Leia withdrew half a pace, so that the edges of the cockpit door were centimeters ahead of her. She blocked the first attack economically, offering no undue motion, extending her weapon not one centimeter forward more than she needed to, conserving her energy. She also extended her awareness through the Force, not to Alima, but to her husband. Attuned to his moods and conceits as she always was, by experience and her nature, she now became almost a second set of eyes just behind him, anticipating his every move on the Falcon's controls. When he began a sudden spiraling dive, Leia knew it was coming a fraction of a second in advance, enough forewarning that she could stabilize herself with a hand on the door jam. Alima was not so prescient. When the maneuver began, she was thrown off balance and her next blow sizzled into the door jam. Neither woman spoke, but their faces told the story of how the duel proceeded. Alima began with a mocking smile. Within the time it took to throw a dozen failed blows, it had faded, replaced by anger. Leia had not bothered to hide her worry and determination, but as Alima grew angrier, Leia allowed a sweet, condescending smile to cross her features. Baffled, Alima stepped back. We are young. You are old. You will tire, or the ship firing on you, whoever it is, will hit your ship, and you will watch your husband die. Leia nodded agreeably. Yes, I keep hearing that sort of thing. Across forty years now, the same speech. One of the downsides of being old. Alima's lip curled, and she lunged again. Alima stared at Jaina, as though the rage she felt could somehow burn holes in the Jedi. She drew a deep breath, 
signal of a tirade to come, and then stopped, looking upward. Jaina felt it too, a sudden sense of satisfaction in the dark energy of this place. It was growing, swelling, absorbing, eating. Eating Zek! Jaina gasped. She reached out through the force to Zek, but he was suddenly no longer there, not in any form she could recognize. Alima laughed. There, your first loss of the day, with more to come. Jaina ignored her, continued looking up. Zek was out there. He had to be, though he might now be so much a part of this place that his presence in the Force was indistinguishable from the energy here. Inside, Jaina withered at the thought. As the Minoc banked to pass before Jaina again, Alima turned toward the Jedi, smiling. No answer for us. We— Then she froze, her eyes going wide. Jaina felt a sudden sense of freedom. Something was leaving this place, something dark and wicked, and Alima Rar paled to a lighter shade of blue. The Twi'lek shook her head. Ship! Jaina looked at her. Problem? Anything I can help with? Ship! Ship! Alima opened her mouth wide, as though to scream, and then vanished from sight, along with the Minoc. The scream did reach Jaina's ears, tiny and distant from far below. Leia kept her guard up and her wits about her, but it was clear. Alima was slowing, tiring. In their last exchange, the Twi'lek's sledgehammer-like blows had grown weaker. Now Alima disengaged, took a step back, opened her mouth for another jibe, and her eyes snapped open wide as though she'd been stabbed from behind. Her next breath was a gasp. Then she disappeared fading instantly from sight. Wary, Leia looked for her opponent within the Force, but she felt no one else aboard the Falcon, just herself and Han. She glanced back over her shoulder. How goes the war? Han's voice was a growl. And it'd be better if you were up in a laser turret. Not until I get the word that Alima's in chains or in a box— he growled again. The flight of Minox, Jag in tow, entered another narrow passage. Jag's captor swung him toward the side, allowing him to scrape along the rocky tunnel. A protruding stone caught him in the back, not hurting him, but bouncing him up away from the wall. He oriented his sensors forward, trying to anticipate the next blow, to avoid it with the use of his thruster pack. They had dragged him through what seemed like kilometers of tunnels, bouncing him off every available surface, and he had not managed to avoid every impact. His left elbow throbbed as though it were damaged or even broken, and his head rang from repeated impact. They entered a new chamber. Jag's sensors picked up a wall in the near distance, perhaps thirty meters away. The Minox angled toward an aperture, and then they were gone, leaving him hurtling toward the vertical stone surface ahead. He kicked in his thruster pack, slowing himself. But the Minox had been moving fast. Despite his braking maneuver, he hit the wall hard. He heard and felt a crack from his left leg, and vision failed, as if his sensors had all suddenly been switched off. Alima stood, legs shaking from where she had fallen. Her senses, back in her own body after too many minutes divided among several phantoms, cast out in the force, looking for ship. Ship was... distant. Ship was fleeing. Ship was happy. Come back! She poured her strength of will into her command. But her effort was too late, 
too distant. Ship sped onward, uncaring. This was bad. Now, instead of having an escape method close at hand, she would have to ascend to the asteroid surface, past the Jedi and the idiot soldier who led them, to steal whatever vehicle had brought them, or lure the Falcon in close, kill Han and Leia, and steal it. This would not be easy. She was already tired, more than tired. As she clambered into the rail car, she tried to make herself small in the force, so that it would be more difficult to find her. The rail car, at least, had no droid brain to malfunction, no Sith sympathies to lead it astray. It had a lever with labels that read up and down. She pushed it toward up, and the car began gliding up the rails. Aboard the Poison Moon New contact, Captain! Ithila sent her sensor board display to Dishon's monitor. Its image, now far less pixelated, but wavering because of the Poison Moon's maneuvers, showed the asteroid habitat. A starfighter-sized craft, emerging from beneath the structure, headed starward. Dishon sat forward. Tiny as it was on the monitor, this was clearly a Sith meditation sphere, the vehicle that had brought Alima Rar to Korriban. Just as clearly, the Twi'lek was making her escape in it. All weapons, bear on the meditation sphere. At my command. Captain, the vehicle is empty. Dishon blinked. She reached out toward the sphere through the force and sensed its mind, its desire, but no occupant. So Alima Rar was still on the asteroid. Interesting. She was having no luck destroying the Millennium Falcon. The freighter's pilot was just too good. Evidence that Han Solo was indeed at the controls. His death would be a great prize, but worth only bragging rights. The meditation sphere, on the other hand, was something tangible, something Dishon could have could keep. It would be the envy of every member of her order. She looked at Wayness. Have the shuttle crews reported in? Are all the explosives charges in place? Yes, Captain. The big one was just activated and delivered. You can begin detonating them any time you like. Follow the new contact. As the poison moon heeled over on its new course, she added, Tell the shuttle crews to assemble on... What's our designation for the largest asteroid in this belt? Omega-379. On Omega-379. We'll be back for them. Probably. She reached out for the meditation sphere and was gratified to still feel it a pulse of dark energy precisely attuned to the ways and wishes of her order. Where are you going, charming one? She expected no answer, but got one. The clear image of a distant world, arctic, forested, a menacing blue-white eye in a sea of darkness. Zeost, Original homeworld of the Sith. She flicked a finger at Wayness. Play in a course for Zeost. All speed. We'll see if we can beat the little fellow there and scoop him up as he arrives. Yes, Captain. And just before we enter hyperspace, begin the bomb triggering sequence. Yes, Captain. Dishon smiled. Congratulations, everyone, on the perfect resolution to a perfect mission. Chapter 27 Aboard the Millennium Falcon They're running. 
Leia, once again in her rear-facing seat position, turned to stare through the forward viewports. What? They're running. Han leaned back and stretched, nonchalant. I chased him off. Sure you did. But on the sensor board, the frigate was indeed outbound. I wonder what they wanted in the first place. Me, of course. Us, I mean. You know the mentality. Leia glared. Oh, I know the mentality, all right. By the way, thanks for not letting our passenger come visit the captain. That's better. On the asteroid, far away from the habitat, light flared, a brilliant, piercing white glow. As it faded, Han and Leia could see damage remaining where it had been. A black and red hole, tiny at this distance, through which atmosphere began venting in a column that rapidly grew to be kilometers tall. Even at the distance of half a kilometer, Jaina saw the rail car ascending toward her. It had running lights, making it easy to spot in the darkness. A quick touch with the force confirmed that neither Jag nor Zek was in control of the vehicle. With her lightsaber, she cut through both rails of the track, then hauled herself up a few meters and cut through again, slicing away a span of track. Then she hauled herself back up, coming to a stop twenty meters above the gap she'd created. The rail car hit the gap. It could have come clean off the rails, floating into the void of the cavern, but it instead angled the other way, and its nose hit the far section of track dead on. It came to a sudden stop, the cars behind it accordioning, piling up like a freight hauler disaster. A small figure was ejected from the lead car. Alima rose, hurtling past the gap, and grabbed at a cross tie, coming to an abrupt stop a handful of meters below Jaina. Jaina smiled down at her. Hello again. Alima's mouth twisted. This is no longer a game. Get out of our way. For me, it was never a game. Say, how are you going to climb the track and swing a lightsaber with only one working arm? We will find a way. Alima ascended another few cross ties. Now she was only three meters beneath Jaina's feet. You could surrender. Throw away your lightsaber, and your blowgun and darts and other toys, pretty much everything on your person, and I'll take you to safety, and you'll live. Alima shook her head. Her half-length brain tail came free of her hood. With the universe still out of balance, with the wicked not punished, we think not— then it came, a low, rumbling roar from some great distance to Jaina's left. She peered off into the darkness, remaining mindful of Alima's position through her sense of the Force. Some new trap? We were about to ask you the same thing. A speaker box aboard the mangled rail car began talking, its voice speaking basic, with a light, lilting accent Jaina had never heard before. Attention all workers of Jonex Mine 811B. Our sensors indicate a catastrophe-level event. Seek the nearest Omega-designated shelter immediately. Activate all emergency beacon composts at once. Attention all workers of Jonex Mine 811B. Faintly. She could hear the same message being echoed off distant stone walls. She glanced down at Alima again. Sounds bad. Guess we'd better stay here until we find out what's gone wrong. Alima released her grip on the cross tie, but did not drift away from the track. She climbed a step toward Jaina, manipulation of the force keeping her steady on the cross ties and drew forth her lightsaber, 
igniting it with a snap hiss. Get out of our way! There was another distant rumble, this time from the right. Jaina's ears popped from a change in pressure. She worked her jaw, equalizing the pressure, and her hearing returned to normal. Sorry, what was that again? She lit her own lightsaber. Idiot! Alima waved, a sweeping gesture, as if slicing with a vibroblade. Energy, invisible, reeking of the dark side, slammed into Jaina, forcing her back. The track she held on to bent several meters above her head, moving her out of the way. The blow drove the wind from her lungs and sent a wave of pain through her chest. In her moment of discomfiture, Alima leapt up past her. She landed on a cross tie twenty meters above Jaina. She began climbing as though the vertical track were a staircase, using only her feet and the force. A blaster bolt from above caught her nearly by surprise. Alima got her blade up in time to absorb some of it, but the impact knocked her back and away from the track. She fell fifty meters or more, and was almost swallowed by darkness before she recovered sufficiently to vector back toward the lower section of track. Grimacing with pain, Jaina looked up. Descending toward her was Jag, in a free fall allayed by infrequent pulses of his backpack thruster. Jaina moved hand over hand along the track, reaching the point where Alima's force attack had bent it, and began climbing from there. If she got high enough, fast enough, she could cut free another section, perhaps making the gap too great for Alima to leap past, even in this low gravity. The track wavered as something hit the angled section she had just left. She glanced back. Jag was there, standing on one leg. Through his visor, Jaina could see that he was sweating, probably from pain. He glanced down toward Alima. Did you give her the chance to surrender? Jaina nodded. She said no. Rudely. That's it, then. He jerked a thumb upward, signaling for her to climb. Go. I'll stay. We have to deal with Alima. I'll deal with Alima. Someone's using explosives. City busters, at least. And they've cracked the shell of this asteroid. The atmosphere's venting. And Zek? He's one chamber up and he's a mess. I can't get him to leave. He'll die here if you don't help him. Jaina looked down at the climbing Alima, up at the distant gap into the next chamber, and finally at Jag. You're going to die. Maybe but my suit can handle hard vacuum for an hour or more. Yours with your mask, five minutes. Who dies first? Go on. When you get to the next cavern, cut the track free. Jaina looked at him. The Jaina of a few weeks ago would have seethed, argued. It was her right to stay here until the bitter end. Her right. Jags, too. Good luck. Her words emerged as a whisper. She leapt up and began climbing as fast as her strength and boosts from the force would allow her. Jag pulled a pouch free of his utility belt and jammed it onto the metal of the track he stood on. Then he fired off his thruster and ascended. He didn't have to worry about overtaking Jaina. She was climbing fast. Below, Alima leapt across the gap separating the lower track from the upper. She landed exactly where Jag had stood moments ago. Jag made sure his comlink was active. Boom one! He wasn't fast enough. He'd uttered the first word when Alima gestured. The explosives package he'd affixed to the rail sailed free of the track. It exploded a moment later. Far enough away that it did no more to Alima than cause the track she stood on to sway. She stared up at him, murder in her eyes, and began climbing again, almost as fast as Jaina, 
faster than Jag's poor low-gravity thrusters could carry him. As she climbed, the bent section of track beneath her twisted back the other way, and then again toward her, and finally came free entirely, a broken section four meters long. Rapidly, borne by invisible powers of the Force, it rose past Alima, flying straight toward Jag. He grimaced. This is going to hurt. The track came level with Jag, a few meters away, then swung toward him like a club, one end remaining in place, the other end hammering at his midsection. The Beskar plate took the force of the blow, but that merely meant it distributed the impact across his entire chest. Jag hurtled to one side like a ball kicked by a rancor, his head and limbs jerking in the opposite direction. His left leg, probably already broken at the thigh, was suddenly engulfed in greater pain, as though his bone marrow had been replaced by a lit lightsaber blade. He flew perhaps thirty meters. But the flying section of track got ahead of him and swung again, batting him back toward Alima. Still, the breastplate held. Still he could breathe, could think. Barely. His body a jangled mass of fiery nerve endings, he crashed into the remaining section of vertical track a couple of meters beneath Alima. He managed to clamp his left crush gaunt onto it. We are sure you flew your X-wing. Alima's face was now covered by a transparasteel mask, probably the same one she wore when escaping her own trap at Galadar 8, Jag guessed. Her voice came across his helmet speakers. Your companions will not have sabotaged it. They want you to escape. So we will leave in it. Small compensation for ship. Clearly, we need to punish you more. It took an effort to make the words emerge in recognizable fashion. Alima, you're never going to leave this asteroid. Your insanity and the last traces of the dark nest end here and now. The shock on Alima's features suggested that she had just witnessed an insect reciting poetry. Profane poetry. Jag felt his stomach lurch just a little. The track they both held had given way and was beginning to fall. Alima, distracted by the sudden sensation of freefall, glanced upward. Fast as a striking sand panther, Jag drew his oversized blaster and aimed it at Alima. He wasn't fast enough. She did not even look down at him. While he was in mid-draw, Alima released her lightsaber and crooked a finger at his blaster. It flew from Jag's grasp into her hand. Her lightsaber floated beside her. Alima looked down at him and shook her head. You die because you oppose us, because you insult the nest. But most of all, you die because you refuse to learn. Oh, but I do learn. The sensor inside that blaster is now informing its processor that it's gone beyond a certain distance from me. Five. Droids firing lasers. Now that would have been intelligent and dangerous to us. Four. We cannot feel droid intent, and lasers travel faster than the eye can follow. Three. Such an attack, executed from secrecy, might well have hurt or killed us. Two. But now, we will simply cut you to pieces. Alima gestured, and her lightsaber began floating its way toward Jag. She watched, her expression cool and detached beneath her faceplate. One. And in that last moment, though Jag had tried to concentrate solely on his pain, 
on his sense of desperation and failure, something of his growing anticipation must have leaked through his emotional barriers. Alima's eyes widened. She looked back and forth for the new danger she was just beginning to sense. The blaster in her hand exploded. The detonation was brilliant and noiseless, sure sign of how near vacuum the atmosphere was. Jag's faceplate polarized almost instantly, leaving him dazzled but not quite blind. He ignited his thrusters, hurtling upward. Alima's face was contorted in shock and pain. Her right arm was gone from just below the elbow. Blood trailed from it, bubbling and evaporating where it left her injury. As Jag reached her, he grabbed her neck in his right hand. She looked at him. Her expression changed from pain to a plea. He shook his head. It's too late. You refused to surrender. Your last act was an attempted murder. I can't spare you. He did not speak these words. They would have taken too long, perhaps giving her time to recover. He could see that there was fear in her eyes, but not fear of death. Her lips moved, forming a single word. Remember. Jag knew he was not suddenly sensitive in the Force, that he could not read her thoughts. But there they were, imprinted on his mind. Remember us. Remember us as we used to be, before the universe turned against us, young, beautiful, strong, brave, admirable, loved, loving. He nodded. I will. The pain and fear in her expression eased. Jag squeezed. He felt the crack of Alima's vertebrae under his hand as they shattered. Her body went limp. Her eyes became unfocused and distant. Static erupted across his comlink. Though there was not enough atmosphere to carry the sound of distant explosions to him, he knew that the high yield of those bombs had to be interfering with comm reception. He hit his thrusters and began rising toward the stone aperture above. Jaina found Zek perched atop a section of track, exactly where she had stood when Alima's mysterious weapon had attacked her and severed the rails. Despite the fact that the air pressure was dropping rapidly, Zek did not have his mask on. Zek, get moving! She fumbled around in his belt pouch, found his foil mask, and slipped it over his head drawing its cinch tight around his collar. He shook his head, not looking at her. Go on. You need to leave. We need to leave. She tugged at his shoulder, bringing him to his knees. It's in me. The evil of this place. I thought I'd be able to keep it at bay forever. No. It doesn't work that way. She crouched, getting her arms around his waist, and then straightened, propelling them both up toward the next section of track. Zek, are you my friend? I'm your friend. I love you. His words emerged almost as a babble, running together and inflectionless. I need... I need you to help me, if I'm going to get out of here alive. They crossed the gap and she grabbed the next section of track. Now climb, or I'll carry you, and I'll be slow, and I'll die. All right. Mechanically, he turned, got his hands on the cross ties, and began climbing. We'll get you back to where the masters are, and they'll get the evil out of you. Oh, maybe. Zek frowned, struggling to remember something. Where's Jag? He's following. The lies sounded unconvincing, 
even pathetic, to Jaina's ears. But Zek, dazed as he seemed to be, didn't notice. He nodded, satisfied. The track wobbled under their hands. Something had to be shaking it. Jaina glanced down, seeing nothing below, and then up. Above them, a giant sphere was rolling down the tracks. It looked like a plant spore, but two meters across instead of microscopic, and made of grayish metal instead of organic material. It did not roll neatly down the track, but adhered to it as if magnetized. Jaina assumed it was indeed magnetic, something designed to adhere to ship hulls. She pulled Zek around to the underside of the track and held on, preparing to leap free if the thing's projections threatened to crush a limb in passing. But the spheroid rolled on past harmlessly, descending into the darkness. Zek stared after it, vaguely curious. What's that? A space mine, I think. Nothing we want to be near when it goes off. Come on, keep climbing. They reached the surface and found the track intact up to the habitat above. But the track shook under their fingers, and they could both see the stony ground shaking all around them, kicking up clouds of dust in oddly beautiful streamers. Jaina saw a distant flash to spinward, a sign of another explosion beyond the horizon. She grabbed Zek and kicked free, leaping toward the hole into the habitat above. Together they floated through. As the artificial gravity of the habitat hit them, they dropped, landing awkwardly on the lip of the hole. Jaina breathed a sigh of relief. Then the shock wave from the last explosion hit. The ground fifteen meters down rippled as though it were cloth laid atop water. Jaina felt her legs shaking, from external vibrations rather than exhaustion. Jag's X-wing, visible beneath the hull, rose on one wing as if banking, then tumbled out of sight. The vibrations increased. The habitat suddenly tilted. The chamber was plunged into darkness, relieved only by the circle of lights around the exit hole, and the two Jedi floated free of the floor. Suddenly, the view through the hole showed more ground, then distant horizon, then stars. The habitat was free of the asteroid, kicked loose by successive explosions, and was tumbling. When the two Jedi forced open the door into the hangar, they found everything beyond in a state of chaos. Dim emergency lighting revealed two stealth X's, dozens of durasteel storage barrels, two refueling pumps, and countless hundreds of hand tools circulating through the large open space, ricocheting, in a slow and stately way in the case of the snub fighters, off the walls and colliding with other free-floating debris. As Jaina watched, one cylindrical metal barrel collided with a strike foil of Zex Stealth X and partially crumpled. Its lid popping free, the greenish hydraulic fluid it held slowly pouring out into the atmosphere and spreading. In addition to the sounds of clanks, crashes, and other collisions, the R-9 astromechs in the two snubfighters were adding screeches and musical tones of dismay to the din. The control board for the hangar door and its atmosphere shield was dead. Jaina glanced at Zek and gestured at the metal storm they faced. No way to manage a safe launch. Get in your cockpit. I'll get the hangar doors open. Zek shook his head. You'll be sucked right out into the void when you do. He sounded a bit stronger, as though distance from the pool of dark side energy was restoring his spirits. I'll use a shadow bomb. Zek winced. A shadow bomb detonated at that proximity to the stealth axes was certain to damage them. But Jaina knew she was right. Opening the hangar doors with a lightsaber and telekinetic nudges from the Force was certain death for the opener. Zek gave her a pained look and pushed off from the wall, floating on an intercept course toward his stealth X. 
Aboard the Millennium Falcon The Falcon's comm board made a brief crackling noise. Then Leia could hear Jaina's voice across it. No checklist, no time. Arming. Zek was next. Shields up. Shields up, copy. Repulsor lifts to max. Hold yourself in place. Leia felt a weight, something like ten tons, drop away from her shoulders. She keyed her comm board. Jaina? Firing! One wall of the distant, tumbling habitat blew out, venting atmosphere and a cloud of particulate matter. A moment later, one stealth X emerged, then another, trailing more debris. One after the other, they angled toward the Falcon. Jaina's next words were stronger. Yes, Mom? Are you all right? As well as can be expected. Jaina's tone was joyless. What about Alima? And Jag? There was a long pause before Jaina's response. Both dead, I think. Chapter 28 Han and Leia watched their monitor screens as the Falcon's rear holocams showed them the last few seconds in the existence of the asteroid. One moment it was there, the next it was replaced by a bright glow and an expanding pulse of energy. Glum, Han activated his comm board. Sensors show an energy yield that says fission bombs to me. I don't think anyone has used fission bombs since near the start of the Yuzhan Vong War. Leia shook her head. Somebody was very serious. No one answered over the comm board. But a noise came from the speakers. Labored breathing. Leia frowned and activated her microphone. Zek, is that you? Not me. It's me! The voice was Jag's, pained. Jag! Four people spoke his name simultaneously. Jaina loudest of all. She added, How did you get off the asteroid? Got to the surface. Calmed my astromech and it gave me distance and bearing to my X-wing. Fortunately, it was upright, just covered in dust. But it's damaged, and I'm... I don't think I can calculate a hyperspace jump right now. Han heaved a sigh of relief. Don't worry about it, kid. We'll run the numbers for you. You just catch up to us. He activated his transceiver, giving Jag's X-Wing a clear signal to home in on. Will do, sir. And don't call me sir. I hate that. Understood, sir. Sanctuary Moon of Endor, Jedi Outpost Luke and Ben, similarly clad in dark Jedi robes, swept into the communications center. At a nod from Luke, the Jedi technician on station there withdrew into the corridor, leaving them alone with the hologram of Han and Leia. Han's hologram offered Luke a lopsided smile. Hey, old buddy. It's good to see you. Luke's gesture suggested he would prefer to be able to embrace his sister and brother-in-law. A live holocom transmission all the way from Bimiel? This is an extravagance for you, isn't it? Leia nodded. Big news calls for a big show. Luke, Alimarar is dead. Luke let out a long breath. At last. He looked between them. She gave you no choice? None. Leia's tone was decisive. Jag is badly injured. Zek is a bit... perturbed, but coming out of it. Jaina is unhurt. Also, the asteroid was destroyed. Luke cocked an eyebrow at her. That seems a little excessive. Han snorted. Not our doing, Luke. An unmarked frigate attacked while we were doing our support role thing. 
They launched shuttles that planted fission bombs all over the asteroid. Then they left. Alima's weird little Sith ship got away, too, but it was unoccupied. Then there's no hint as to who blew up the asteroid or why? Han shook his head. A complete mystery. And you know how I feel about complete mysteries. You don't care, as long as they don't interfere with you getting paid. Han grinned. Something like that. Leia said, We're going to transport Jag to you. Jaina and Zek will escort us in. Luke nodded. It'll be good to see you. He glanced at the monitor that displayed data about this communication. Another few seconds, and the odds of this contact being traced go up by an order of magnitude. See you in a couple of days, old buddy. Han reached off to the side, his hand disappearing as it extended beyond the range of the holocam at his end, and the hologram winked out. Luke felt like sitting down, letting gravity just overcome him for a while. But that might worry Ben. At least it was over. Finally over. Mara's killer was no longer a threat to him, to his family. He felt a touch of regret. Unlike Jason, Ali Marar had insanity to blame for the evils she perpetrated. If she had been able to accept help, she might have remained a force for calmness and order. But that was pointless speculation. Her life had ended. Perhaps Mara could rest easy now. Dad? Yes? Are you all right? Luke nodded. Better. Mara's murderer has met justice. And we can put that uncertainty behind us. Yes. Luke turned to face his son. There was something in Ben's reply... It was not in the tone of his voice, but there had been a little tug in the force when Ben spoke. Surely Ben didn't doubt that Alima was truly dead. Leia would not have said she was if there were any doubt. Luke pushed the question from his mind. Ben would tell him what was bothering him when he was ready. Why don't you go get in some training? I have some thinking to do. Ben nodded. Dubious. Let me know if you need anything. Sure, Ben. On the outpost roof, Luke sat cross-legged on the hard surface of the landing pad, his back straight, a meditative posture. He could feel the permacrete surface beneath him, feel it as though it were a skin, connected to the outpost's permacrete and durasteel bones, its beams, its support columns, extending down into the soil and all the way to bedrock. He could feel the kilometers-thick mantle of stone beneath the bedrock, stretching down to the core of the moon, its massiveness suggesting eternity. He opened himself to the Force and could feel the vibrancy of life around him, the energies of all the people in the outpost, the vitality of all the growing things. Once... Such a contact would have brought him serenity. It would have been peace to his spirit. Now it was merely information. And the Force still offered him no guidance, no visions of his enemies, no glimpses of his future. He was no longer disturbed by any of this. He needed no reassurances about his future. Perhaps it all meant that there was no future to glimpse. Luke found himself to be unworried by the thought. There was a hum, the distinctive noise of the roof access lift. Luke could feel the force presence of his son arrive, could hear him approach. Ben hesitated, then moved into view, settling to the permacrete directly opposite Luke, assuming the same meditative pose. The boy did not speak, but neither did he relax into proper meditation. Luke could read Ben's emotions as clearly as though they were on the screen of a datapad. Restlessness, concern. 
and an unusual degree of mental focus. Luke let the boy wait. Eventually, Ben's restlessness would get the better of him, and he would speak his mind. That was the way of the young, of apprentices. But Ben still did not speak, and Luke could feel him become calmer, more settled, although his focus did not waver. Luke waited while breezes carrying the scents of the Endor forest stirred his hair. Your feelings betray you, Ben. It was almost a ritual phrase now. The truth, cloaked in, and perhaps even disguised, by cliché. Ben studied him, no emotion on his face. Betray me? Do they stab me in the back? Or do they just give me a swift kick in the butt? Despite himself, Luke grinned. It's true. Under many circumstances, being betrayed by your emotions will do you no harm. But it's still best to remain aware of the fact that you are expressing them so clearly, transmitting them for anyone sufficiently sensitive to feel. All right. Luke paused. Clearly the boy was not willing to be drawn out. You think something is wrong. Wrong with me. Wrong is one of those kind of relative things. If I think something is wrong and you think it's right, which one of us is correct? Luke nodded. It was a good response. I suspect I would be. It's the whole master-apprentice, father-son, wise old man, foolish young man thing. Right. It's nice that to be older is to always be right. I can't wait to be older. So? Ben took a moment to compose himself and his thoughts. I'm trying to figure out why you don't have any energy. I have energy. It's waiting. In reserve. Yeah, maybe. Except your energy used to empower other people, too. Get them moving. Make them enthusiastic. Not anymore. Ever since Mom was killed, you've been like someone with a landspeeder resting on his back, crushed flat, hardly able to move because of the pain. I mean, me too, but for me, over time, that landspeeder has slipped off mostly. I kind of expected that when we learned that the one who'd killed her was captured or dead, the landspeeder would be gone from your back too that you'd be able to move again. Luke frowned, puzzled. I can move. I'm not so sure. And I'm trying to figure out why. Let's do some lightsaber training. You'll see more of me moving than you want to. Ben shook his head. You're still not you. People are asking questions. Things like... When is Luke Skywalker going to find his center and make things better again? Nobody knows what to tell them. Make things better? Luke tried not to let his surprise show, but it crept into his voice. You mean snap my fingers, end this war, and cause flower petals to rain down on all civilized worlds? Yeah, just like that. Ben grinned then sobered. No, I think they just mean, when are you going to really take charge again? Of the Jedi, our role in the war. Lead, not just direct. Because that will make a difference. Luke felt his spirits sag even lower. Oh, Ben. They're asking that sort of question out of a misguided sense of what I can accomplish. They've based their impressions of what I can do on things that happened when I was a younger man, with blind luck and boundless energy, and when you could count all the known Force users in the galaxy on the fingers of one hand. Other Jedi can do what I do. No, they can't. They can't be Luke Skywalker. 
Luke studied the landing pad's surface for a moment. It could still serve its primary purpose, but it was scuffed, weathered, more frail than it had been when first installed. It seemed a perfect metaphor for his situation. You can't turn back time. It's not a landspeeder resting on my back. It's the weight of years and events. I can't cast them off. And even if I could, I'd undo everything I've learned from them. Today I'm more useful as a teacher, a distributor of resources. That's my role. I really ought to be thinking about grooming a viable candidate to become the next Grand Master. Ben didn't speak for long moments, and Luke felt a growing swell of confusion and concern radiate from the boy. Then there was a jolt of stronger emotion from Ben. Fear. Luke looked up to see Ben suddenly on his feet, staring with an expression of naked alarm on his face. Luke offered a quizzical look. What is it? I don't know how to say it. What are the right words? Ben turned away from his father, looked around as if seeking confirmation from faces that weren't there, and turned back again. He was suddenly as frantic as someone at the crossroads of a maze with stormtroopers coming up behind him. Which way of several was best? Which ways led to capture or death? And then he was pacing, running his fingers through his hair, ruffling it as though the sudden untidiness would help the thoughts escape. You want to be with Mom! Of course I do. Don't you? Yes, but for me it's different. I want her to be here, with us. Ben stopped in mid-stride and whirled to face his father a graceful move that Luke could appreciate with the Jedi Master portion of his mind. You want to be with her where she is. What do you mean? You want to be dead. At peace. With her. Dead. That's ridiculous. No, it isn't. When Uncle Han and Aunt Leia told us Ali Marar was dead, you should have said, Now I can get back to work. Instead, you're saying... Now I can turn over the Jedi Order to someone who's worthy. You're getting ready to die. Problem is, you don't have an incurable disease or a blaster pressed against your head. So how's it going to happen? Ben's voice cracked on the final word. Ben, that is so... so... You're just leaping to the wrong conclusion. Luke struggled for the right argument to make his son see that this was a ridiculous notion. But the argument just wasn't there. That's what attachment is, isn't it? Ben began pacing again, and words finally poured from him like water running through a shattered dam. It's not loving somebody. It's not marrying somebody. It's not having kids. It's being where, if something goes wrong, there's nothing left of you. It's where if she goes away... You start functioning like a droid with a restraining bolt installed. Mom wouldn't want you to be this way. So why are you? I can't help it. Luke was on his feet, and the words wrenched out of him before he realized it. He rocked, unbalanced by the sudden violence of his emotions. Ben spun to stare at him. You've got to! How? I don't know. You're the Jedi Master. You figure it out. Luke felt real anger stir within him, a fire fanned by the insolence of Ben's tone. No, that was another lie, Luke lying to himself. The fire was being fanned by the fact that Ben was right. Luke closed his eyes, feeling his way through the insulation of peacefulness he'd constructed for himself across these past months. Beyond it, he tried to find himself. But at first he could feel nothing but the weight of his grief, and the one thing that kept him functioning while carrying that burden. His desire to be reunited with Mara. Reunited when the time came. Reunited in the Force. Then there was the other weight, the one he had largely slipped from his shoulders, the weight of his responsibility, 
to the Order, to his family, to the galaxy, to the living. Of course he had shrugged it off. No man could carry two such weights for any length of time. He would be crushed beneath them. But he had to carry the one he had set aside, didn't he? I'm sorry, Mara. Knowing it to be a betrayal, Luke slowly, carefully, stepped out from under his grief. It didn't leave him entirely. Just as Mara was still part of him, the pain of losing her would always be with him, too. But suddenly it was easier to breathe, to think. He wondered how long it had been since he had truly thought clearly. And curiously, it didn't feel like a betrayal at all. Then there was that other weight, the weight of duty. He had carried it throughout his adult life, and at times it had ground him down. But at other times it had sustained him, helped keep him alive. Perhaps that was why he had been so willing to abandon it. It had been keeping him alive at a time when he did not want to live. With meticulous care, he picked up and shouldered that other weight. He opened his eyes. His son stood before him, anxious. But now Ben sighed, a brief exhalation of relief. Hey, Dad. Look in a mirror. I don't need to. You know what? Your feelings betray you. Luke suppressed a snort. Ben, if you ever, ever say I told you so, I won't. I'll put you through a training session that would make Kip Duran cry. I won't, I won't. How did you get so smart, anyway? When I wasn't looking? Ben shrugged, once again an adolescent at a loss for words. Luke put an arm around his son's shoulders and led him toward the lift. You know, these are unsettled times. Things are too busy for many of our usual formalities. For ceremonies. For rites. Ben frowned, suspicious. What are you getting at? I think you should begin building your lightsaber. Ben skidded to a stop and looked at Luke. But... But I haven't faced my trials. What do you call pulling yourself back from the brink that Jason pushed you to? And then pulling the Grand Master back from his own brink? Being obstinate? Show me a Jedi Knight who isn't obstinate. Luke stepped onto the lift plate and held his toe over the button inset in the permacrete. Get to work on your weapon, son. He pressed the button and let the turbo lift carry him down, back to his work, back to his responsibility. Chapter 29 Sanctuary Moon of Endor Shuttle Reveille on Approach the forest stretched for countless kilometers in every direction, but below was a clearing broad enough to house several sports complexes, and at its center was a huge sheet of durasteel, curved like the roof of a prefabricated building, burned through in places by the violence of uncontrolled atmospheric entry, elsewhere rusted in spots the size of whole freighters. Nearly forty years earlier, it had been cast off the second Death Star when that vessel exploded. It had come to ground here, crushing and igniting all life beneath it, creating a clearing where before there had been tall trees. Now, decades later, grasses, flowers, and vines grew around the relic. But trees were slow in returning to the once-burned spot. See all Antilles at the pilot's controls— 
banked the shuttle over the site, taking note of objects and living things on the ground. The Millennium Falcon, half protruding from the shadow of the giant metal plate, X-wings, shuttles, Jedi, droids, Ewoks. The Ewoks clambered on the vehicles, climbed the curved slopes of the Death Star remnant. Some had constructed sleds of wood planks and leather, and now they rode the sleds down the smoother, unrusted slopes of the metal plate. Seal whistled. What a relic! If my sister Miri were here, she'd be cutting three centimeter squares off that thing and selling them as souvenirs. Get your own piece of history. Own a part of the second Death Star. General Selchu, relaxing in the co-pilot's seat, offered a non-committal, Ah. Sial glanced at him, remembering too late, as usual, that her words might dredge up bad memories. Tycho's world of Alderaan had been destroyed by the first Death Star. At the precise moment he was in live holocom contact with his family on that planet. He had been part of the mission to destroy the second Death Star, flying a first-generation A-wing into the gigantic vehicle's superstructure. Had his skills and reflexes been just a touch less brilliant in those days, his A-wing and his bones might now be lying beneath that wreckage. She winced. I'm sorry. Was that stupid of me? Absently, he shook his head. No. But your comment about your sister made me think... Yes? Maybe we could get a cutting torch and pick up a few square meters of it before the shuttle heads back to Coruscant. She grinned. Moments later, following the landing beacon being transmitted to her, she brought the Reveille down to a smooth, wings-up landing near the Millennium Falcon. A quick post-flight checklist later, she, Tycho, and their passenger stood at the top of the boarding ramp. As the ramp lowered, it revealed the face of the uniformed man standing below. Tycho leaned over to whisper in her ear, Antilles, you're off duty. Thank you, sir. The ramp touched down, and she ran down its length, throwing herself into the arms of the man waiting there. Daddy! Luke grinned at, but otherwise ignored, the Antilles reunion and waited for General Selchu to descend. Tycho came down the ramp, accompanied by a man who was decidedly unmilitary, a bit paunchy, black-bearded, dressed in plain black trousers, and a shirt printed with the vista of a volcanic world. In fact, it was more than printed. As Luke watched, one of the volcanoes seemed to erupt, silently spewing smoke and lava up from belly level to nearly the height of the man's collar. Tycho shook Luke's hand. Grandmaster Skywalker, allow me to introduce... Dr. Saya! Ben trotted up, a hand extended to the black-haired man. I'm surprised you're not dead or something. Saya smiled. Good to see you, Ben. You've gotten taller. Good. Ben turned to his father. Dr. Saya is the man who briefed me on Centerpoint Station. He's a gravitic physicist and spy. Saya shook Luke's hand in turn. More successful as a physicist than a spy, I suppose. Which is why I'm here. Tycho nodded. Dr. Saya is on Colonel Solo's arrest, interrogate, and execute list. For presumed treason. Which I know to be incorrect. I, uh, picked him up just before the G.A.G. goons came for him. He's been in safe houses since, but it's hard to keep him out of sight of Solo's investigators. Ben wrinkled his nose. I can totally see that, considering how he dresses. Tycho smiled. Grandmaster, I was hoping we could leave him with you. Luke snorted, amused. At least you have the courtesy to identify your spies when you try to place them with us. Deadpan, Tycho nodded. Galactic Alliance Intelligence. We're the courteous alternative. Luke stepped aside, 
and gestured for the newcomers to precede him. Let's get you some food and calf. Then we can talk. Wedge decided that the group Luke led through the Death Star wreckage was a mob, and it was perhaps the most dangerous mob within five hundred light years. Following him and Luke were Han and Leia, Jaina and Zek, Seal, Tycho, Saba Sabatine, and Corin Horn, Ben and Kyle Katarn, who trailed the pack but otherwise seemed to be moving well. Luke chose a shady spot beneath an overhang of Death Star Hall. He spread out his cloak on the bare dirt there and sat, gesturing for Han and Leia to join him. The others sat on Jedi cloaks or the bare ground. Without preamble, Luke began. I've had a brief talk with General Selchu here, and I'm going to go over some points he made and some other details that have come up recently. Together, we're going to make some decisions about a course of action. Wedge saw Saba Sabatine nod approvingly. Luke gestured at Tycho. The general came here to make an official request by the G.A. government that the Jedi Order return to the Galactic Alliance fold, as is our sworn duty. Wedge grinned. Five credits says the invitation came only from Admiral Neothel and that Colonel Solo had no part in it. There were no takers. Wedge continued. I think I need to put Tycho's presence here in perspective. All this is speculation on my part, but I speculate pretty well. Tycho wouldn't have asked for this meeting on his own initiative, because he doesn't represent the GA in these matters. But he hasn't once suggested that he's here on behalf of his boss, Admiral Neothel which means he's here with either her overt or tacit approval, representing her interests as Joint Chief of State of the G.A. If anything goes wrong with this mission, he and his career go up in a flash of smoke, but it's something that has to be done. And now he's not going to say anything, because he can offer neither confirmation nor denial of what I've just said. He grinned at his old friend. Tycho's jaw worked for a moment, then set. He contented himself merely with glaring at Wedge. Luke grinned. I said no to General Selchu's request, for the simple reason that any action that puts the order under the command of, or potentially at the mercy of, Jason Solo, is an unacceptable one, particularly after what happened at Asus. My position remains that we serve the G.A. best by determining the course of action that is best for everyone, and then implementing it, at least until such time as the G.A. Chief of State's office can be considered trustworthy again. There were nods from all around the assembly. Let me make this clear, though. Luke fixed Tycho with his gaze. We serve the Galactic Alliance. When Jason Solo is no longer a factor, we will return our seat of authority to Coruscant. We retain trust in Admiral Neothel. Tycho nodded. I understand and appreciate that. But once I file my report with her, there's always the chance that Colonel Solo will gain access to it and learn that you're now stationed on Endor. By the time you get back to Coruscant, we won't be on Endor any longer. Luke looked among the others. Now, in the spirit of serving the Alliance, at least what we want the Alliance to be, and of serving the greater good, we're going to sketch out our next operation, which in part will be to rescue Alana, Chumda of the Hapes Consortium and daughter of Tenel Ka, from captivity at the hands of Jason Solo. Tycho raised a hand. Yes, General? Let me see if I understand this. You're going to help the Alliance this way. Tycho began counting items off on his fingers. First, you return the Chumda to the Queen Mother. Second, the Queen Mother again, who by now must hate Jason Solo absolutely, turns her fleets against him and the G.A. Third, the Confederation 
at that point stronger than the Alliance, conquers the Alliance. Fourth, he paused as if confused. There is no fourth. Luke smiled. I left out a detail. Ah, uh, good. I was worried there. The Corellians just used Centerpoint Station to destroy elements of the Second Fleet. They also tried to kill Jason. Now, thinking the way Jason does, the way he must, it's inconceivable that he would not make an all-out effort to capture the station and have in his possession the most powerful weapon in the galaxy. We're not going to let the Corellians have it, and we're not going to let Jason have it. We're going to destroy it, probably at the same time Jason mounts his operation to capture it. Tycho shook his head. So you continue to deprive us of the Hapen fleets, and you deprive us of Centerpoint Station. No. We give the Queen Mother the right, her right, to negotiate the terms under which her fleets will be used by the Alliance and we deprive the Confederation of Centerpoint Station. This will result in a morale blow to the Confederation and will cost them allies. If the Hapens stay out of it, the two sides remain roughly equal for now. If Admiral Neothel can stuff Jason into a box, the Hapens return to the Alliance fold, and the Alliance is suddenly the stronger side. The General continued to look unhappy. There are a lot of ifs in that plan, Grandmaster. True. How do you intend to do it? Luke glanced toward Kyle Katarn for a moment. It's inevitable that Jason will command the mission to Centerpoint Station himself. We've managed to plant a tracer beacon on him, and he still apparently hasn't detected it. Sadly, it's very short range. But if we can keep stealth X's in rotation near the Anakin Solo we can detect when the mission starts. It would be better if we had a longer-range tracer, but we'll use what we have. Then, Leia, looking curiously guilty, interrupted. Actually, there's a full-power holocom beacon on Jason's ship. Zek planted it. He also disabled their tractor beam, partly to allow us to escape and partly to give the ship mechanics some sabotage to detect and repair, so that they would miss the more subtle addition to their holocom system. Luke looked between Leia and Zek. When was this? Zek shrugged. When we raided to get the information on Brisha Sio's asteroid from his shuttle memory. It would have been useful to have known this earlier. Han shifted, uncomfortable. We've been busy putting out fires. Luke sighed, then continued. With our new fancy holocom beacon on the Anakin Solo, we detect when Jason begins his operation and jump to Corellia. General Selchu brought us an expert who can help us figure out how to destroy it. That's not what I brought him for. Regardless, he was willing to help blow it up once, He'll be willing to help blow it up a second time. Luke shrugged apologetically and moved on. Meanwhile, we send a unit of Jedi aboard the Anakin Solo to distract Jason and to retrieve the Chumda. How do you plan to get them aboard? Han sounded dubious. I kind of doubt the old love commander trick will work a second time. Luke looked at Tycho. General, when you arrived, your shuttle transceiver broadcast what I assumed was a false registration and identity. I also assume that it's capable of broadcasting a registration and identity consistent with General Selchu of Starfighter Command. Tycho nodded. Of course. Luke spread his palms. There you have it. We go in on General Selchu's shuttle. Slowly, Tycho shook his head. Much as I personally might want you to succeed in this, I sort of have to say no. Duty and officer's oaths and all that. You understand. Oh, that's right. 
Luke turned to Wedge. Could I trouble you to set your blaster on stun and point it at the other general? No, not really. Please? Wedge sighed. I'm not going to point a blaster at my best friend. Plus, his pilot will be obliged to jump in the way or do something equally noble and foolish. I'm not going to point a blaster at my little girl. Thank you, Daddy. Wedge thought about it. I do have a solution, though. He pointed his forefinger at Tycho, aligning his thumb straight up. Imagine that's a blaster. Wait a second. He adjusted an imaginary knob on his thumb. Had to make sure it was on stun. Tycho looked at his hand. I'm imagining that it's a Blastech DL-18. Wedge shrugged. An adequate choice, under these circumstances. Maybe. If we'd all imagined that it was a DL-44, big and imposing, I might actually be intimidated. A DL-18 is barely worth surrendering to. Seal shook her head. Her expression sat. Luke began looking from face to face as he spoke. Wedge, handpick a starfighter squadron. We'll use it to chase the shuttle to safety aboard the Anakin Solo, then to support any operation against Center Point Station. I'll lead a unit of Jedi to assault Jason. Our job will be to take him out, if possible, and to distract him from the rescue operation in any case. Han, Leia, I want you to lead the expedition to rescue the Chumda. Master Katarn, I want you in reserve for extraction of the assault and rescue teams. Dr. Saya and our scientific staff will come up with the best ways to destroy Center Point Station. Then, owing to your experience there, I want you on that mission. Ben shook his head. I'll be more useful accompanying you aboard the Anakin Solo. How do you figure that? Because with both of us boarding, Jason will conclude that we're there to kill him. It will help keep him from guessing that Alana is the mission's real goal. And he won't be wondering where I am or what I'm up to. Luke gave his son a close look. And will diversion be your genuine intent? Not revenge? Yes, Grandmaster. All right, then. Luke rose, prompting the others to do the same. He turned to Tycho. General, I'm sorry about imprisoning you and your pilot, and stealing your shuttle, and exposing you to Ewoks again, and such. Tycho shrugged. I acknowledge that, from your perspective, you have to keep me a prisoner until your operation begins, to keep me from doing my duty and alerting the Alliance. Yes? There's no reason why you couldn't take me with you to Colonel Solo's action against Corellia, put me in the cockpit of a starfighter, and let me make my way home from there. After I fly around getting a good look at everything, that is. Good point, Luke nodded. We may do that. And your pilot? Oh, you don't have to imprison her at all. Tycho reached into his tunic pocket. Wedge's forefinger dug into Tycho's ribs. No tricks. Tycho grinned and passed Luke a data card. In our ongoing effort to maintain cordial relations with the Jedi Order, and thus affect your rapid return to the Galactic Alliance, I present you with our special envoy, Captain Seal Antilles, who will remain with you and communicate with my office whenever you permit. Seal's jaw dropped. Wait, what? Tycho fixed her with a stern look. This assignment is no milk run, Antilles. This is a tricky diplomatic mission with a lot at stake, and just trying to keep up with the Jedi can get you killed. But if you help keep the Alliance and the Jedi in touch, if you keep them talking, you'll be making a big difference in this war. Wedge looked proud and reflective. 
I was years older than you when I became an ambassador for the first time. Remember that, Tycho? How did we get through that assignment anyway? Pretty much we opened fire on everyone who disagreed with us. Wedge nodded and turned to his daughter. When all else fails, just do that. Chapter 30 Sanctuary Moon of Endor, Jedi Outpost Jag lay on the medical ward bed. He might have been mistaken for a dead man, but for the very slow rise and fall of his chest. Jaina, sitting on a chair near the foot of the bed, had a good sense of how nearly dead Jag had been. He'd had damage to his neck, a fracture to his left elbow, multiple breaks in his left thigh, internal injuries— since he would never have survived a direct jump from the asteroid system to Endor in the cockpit of a starfighter, they had made a short jump to Bimiel, transferred Jag to the Falcon, and left his X-wing covered by camouflage sheets and sand in a chilly tundra valley. But now, after time in a restorative Bacta tank, after medicines and rest, the medics said he was much improved. He would soon recover fully. Jaina wasn't sure. In the Force, Jag didn't feel like a man struggling back toward health and vitality. Jag opened his eyes. He didn't move, not even to turn his head, until he'd seen everything he could from his position. A survival trait, Jaina decided, possibly one he learned while stranded on Tanoop. Finally, he turned his head and saw her. He offered no smile, but he did speak. Hello. Hello yourself. Remember much? Yes. He started to nod, thought the better of it as half-healed injuries pulled. I remember everything. Except where we are. Endor, you were unconscious when we got here. Ah. And Zek? Better. He was kind of a mess coming out of the asteroid. He took the same amount of damage you did. But emotional, not physical. Too bad. Physical scars are much better conversation starters at parties. He turned his attention to the ceiling and studied it for long moments. Well... Mission accomplished. That's right. Mission accomplished. And you've done what you needed to. To help restore your family honor. Yes. There was no pleasure in that word. Just acknowledgement. Jaina wished she hadn't brought up the subject of his family. The Fells, though a human family of Corellian ancestry, Jag's mother was Wedge's older sister the first C. Al Antilles, now lived in the Chiss Ascendancy, by the rules of that blue-skinned folk. And those rules dictated that, because of mistakes and decisions made by other people, Jaina among them, Jag could never go home. Hunting down Alima Rar had been the last task assigned to him by his clan. In accomplishing it, he had severed his last ties with them. In fact, the realization struck Jaina like a blow in combat practice. The act of ending the threat posed by Alima had perhaps severed his last ties with everyone. She made her voice gentle, an unaccustomed task for her. What's next for you? He shrugged, wincing as the action pulled at some of his injuries. There's a war on. I'm sure someone needs a pilot. Stay with the Jedi. Sure. Suddenly she was impatient with him. I don't mean as a civilian employee. I mean as a friend. He finally looked at her again. I haven't done a very good job of making friends. I would rate my success at nearly zero. Zek looks on you as a friend. Yes. 
Well, without him, my rate of success would be exactly zero. And truth be told, for reasons I'm sure you understand, he would probably prefer that I not be around too much. I'm your friend. Are you? She heaved an exasperated sigh. Oh, we're not having this conversation again. No, we're not. This is a new one. I'm not asking you to set aside your focus, to distract yourself from training for your next mission. I'm not asking you to roll the chrono back 15 years to when we were teenagers. Despite the discomfort, he pulled himself back so that he could sit up against the pillows at the head of his bed. I'm asking you to tell me if I have a place in your life, someone you'd turn to if you'd ever just acknowledged that you needed some help, someone you'd miss more than occasionally if he went away. Am I your friend? Knowing the answer he wanted to hear, the answer that would help him get better, Jaina opened her mouth to offer it. Then she shut up again. He deserved better than that. He deserved the truth. She just wasn't sure what the truth was. It took her long moments to sift out her feelings from the bewildering, insulating layer of decisions and codes of conduct she'd fabricated for herself. To find it, she had to look past what she had to do and be. She had to find the place where she kept what she wanted to do and be. But she found her answer. Yes. I am. Good. He held out his hand. She put hers on it. He relaxed. So, what's next for you? A mission. Simple stuff. Rescue a princess. A solo family tradition. Blow up a big space station. Also a solo family tradition. You can get in on it, if you can get yourself back in shape in time. I will. And if you ever need someone to dress up in a black costume and beat you up, Jaina smiled. Just shut up. Corellia, Coronet, Command Bunker This late at night, with no enemy forces in orbit, the Command Bunker was nearly deserted and usually the hum of atmosphere conditioners was the only thing to be heard on most floors, in most chambers. But in the primary communications chamber, not the elegant studio where most transmissions were initiated or received, not the secure prime minister's chamber where Sadris Koyan did so much of his talking, the banks of holocom equipment were alive, adding their own hum to the ambient noise. Minister of Information Denjax Tepler looked up for the thousandth time, making sure that the door into the chamber was still secure, that there were no warning diodes lit on the devices he had patched in to subvert the holocam over the door. Then he returned his attention to his task at hand. One of the holocom control banks was open before him, and it was the work of just a few more moments to finish wiring in the bypass card he'd brought the device that would keep the communication he was about to receive from being copied to the offices of Corellian security. For he was about to commit yet another act of treason, and he needed to do it properly. His task finished, he stepped to the primary control panel, checked his chrono, and activated the device. He moved to stand against the chamber's one blank wall, an auxiliary transmission spot that had not been used in years. Thirty seconds later, a glow appeared in the air before him and resolved into a holographic shape. General Tur Fenner, scarred and imposing, and just a bit over a meter tall. Good afternoon, Minister Tepler. Night's where I am, but I reciprocate. Tepler frowned. How tall... Never mind. There's something wrong at my end. Hold on. He moved back to the control panel, 
noted that the received image scale preference was set to 60% for this transmission origin and overrode it temporarily, setting it to 100%. Fenner flickered, then instantly assumed Tepler's own height. Tepler returned to the wall and now could look the general eye to eye at the same altitude. That's better. Another symptom of your leader's mental deficits. Tepler waved that subject away. I didn't ask for this communication to discuss the Prime Minister's eccentricities. I asked for it so we could talk about your unofficial embargo of Corellia. You're holding back supplies and materiel we desperately need. And I agreed to this exchange because Koyan's incompetence must be our main topic of discussion. Because that incompetence is the reason for the embargo. Tepler grimaced. We're an ally, and you've left us dangerously vulnerable. Allow me to explain why. Because you're a politician, I will use similes and other conversational aids. Not to mention insults. Fenner paused. You're right. My anger at the Prime Minister has spilled over to you. I apologize. Still, imagine you're a mighty warrior. You would be less mighty if you lost one of your arms. True. It would behoove you not to lose one of your arms. Yet you're walking in the jungle, and are bitten on the wrist by a venomous animal. The venom will spread from your arm and fatally poison the rest of you in less than a minute. What do you do? Well, if you've prepared properly for this expedition, you break out the antitoxin and inject it. Correct. But in this instance, you have no antitoxin. You have only a large vibroblade. Then you tie off a tourniquet, cut your own arm off, and hope you can inject the painkillers before you black out. Also correct, because to be a mighty warrior, you need one thing more than you need to have both arms. Your life. Yes. Tepler thought it through. You're saying that the Confederation is the warrior, and Corellia is the arm. Yes, and Sadris Koyan is the venom. His use of Centerpoint Station struck almost as deadly a blow to us as it did to the enemy, in terms of morale, of ensuring cooperation between our armed forces. And it's clear that if we win this war, and I mean if, not when. His first act will be to point the station at one of his allies and begin to dictate the terms of peace and post-war prosperity. What are you suggesting? Remove him from power. It's not as easy as that. We have a coalition government whose representatives jockey for power endlessly. I'm not telling you who to put in power. I'm telling you to remove Koyin, which is as easy as that. It can be done with a small group of specialists who spirit him away in the night and return him when the war is done. It can be done with a holdout blaster pressed to his kidney and fired. It can be done with planted evidence that does nothing more than prove that he's the idiot he is. Fenner leaned close. I'm not playing kingmaker here. I don't want to decide who governs Corellia. I just need you to choose a ruler I can work with. Until you do, Corellia stays outside the comfort of our campfire. I'll think about what you're saying. Good. Fenner actually fidgeted and his tone became conspiratorial. Listen. I'll admit that I don't understand you Corellians. You place the value of freedom 
so far above that of duty, that you're incomprehensible to me. I've flown with and against the best, most disciplined pilots Corellia has offered. Soontir fell, Wedge Antilles, and I don't even understand them. Perhaps that's my failing. But the Confederation will fall apart if Koyan remains in charge. Get me someone who can understand me. Tepler nodded. Understood. Fenner gave him a half bow. Then his hologram disappeared. Moving fast, Tepler pulled out the card he'd meticulously wired into the holocom. He pressed a button on it, sending an electrical charge through the frail device, burning out its memory and circuits, destroying most of the evidence of his actions here. Fenner was right. But Tepler though he had briefly been Five Worlds Prime Minister, didn't know if he'd be better than Koyan in that role in this time of war. Nor did he know if any military officer could cope with the nearly carnivorous needs for attention and status that characterized the Corellian planetary chiefs of state he'd have to deal with. He slapped shut the panel on the holocom and got to work around the chamber, using a chemical-soaked felt cloth to wipe down every surface he had touched. Fingerprints and genetic evidence were simultaneously destroyed with each stroke. Wait. The Alliance now had a chief of state office shared by two collaborators, one originally civilian, one originally military. The same structure might work for Corellia. Admiral Delpin was intelligent, reasonable, and, unlike Koyan, honorable. She could bring the support of Corellian defense while Tepler wrangled the civilian chiefs. It could work, if they could be rid of Sadra's Koyan. And soon. Tepler paused at the doorway into the chamber and surveyed his handiwork. There was nothing to see suggesting he had ever been here. Nothing but the wires leading from his holocom subversion device to the recording device above the door. He grabbed the device and gave it a yank, pulling its data wire free of the holocam. He put the rig in his pocket with the burned-out card. Yes, Admiral Delpin. Perhaps, despite her bearing and reputation, she was willing to become as big a traitor as Tepler himself. Chapter 31 Coruscant System Aboard the Anakin Solo. At peace with himself, Kytus stared through the bridge viewports at the stars, at the trails of running lights indicating the presence of ships arriving at or departing Coruscant. Alana was no longer afraid of him, and had accepted him instantly, with boundless affection, as her father. The Hapens were still behaving well enough now staging raids on critical Confederation sites and resources. Titus himself felt healthy again, fully healed for the first time since his fight with Luke. And right up to the day of Kytus's operation to capture Centerpoint, Corellia's defenses had been growing weaker, more lax. Kytus was certain this was no ploy on the part of the Corellians— G.A. Intelligence believed that Confederation supply lines were being taxed past their limits, and Corellia was not being adequately reprovisioned. In a day, he would own Centerpoint. In a week, the major allies of the Confederation would have surrendered. This war was almost done. Sir? Lieutenant Tebut approached from the stern end of the bridge. Today, Kytus recalled... Her duty station was ship security. She presented him with the duty data pad for her station. All ship sections report secure. Anomalies and unresolved incidents are at a record low. Excellent work. Kytus took the data pad from her and tapped its screen, activating the hotspot acknowledging receipt of the report. He turned away, looking at the starfield again as he handed the device back to her. In his inattentiveness, he released it a moment too early. 
Tebut juggled and dropped it. It hit the bridge floor. Kytus looked at her. My apologies, sir. She stooped to pick up the datapad. She glanced at its screen. Kytus could see that it was undamaged. Tebut snapped it shut, saluted, and turned away. Two steps later, she skidded to a stop and looked back at him. Lieutenant? Her voice was distant. New anomaly. She moved toward him again. Sir, this is perhaps none of my business, but it has been my observation that you get rid of clothes when they become worn or stop being able to hold creases. Kytus nodded. Not just clothes. Yes, sir. So why are you wearing a patched cloak? If I may ask. Patched? He looked down at himself. Tebut stooped again, then rose, bringing up the lower hem of his cloak, turning it so Kytus could see the backside. There, placed in a slightly crooked fashion, was a square cloth patch, five centimeters on a side, identical in color and texture to the surrounding cloak material. Kytus took the hem and stared at it. He tugged at the corner of the patch. Reluctantly, it yielded, coming up from the cloak material, revealing glue and flexible circuitry beneath. Though his good mood was spoiled, he kept the fact from his face. We all make mistakes, Lieutenant. And it appears that one of mine was to let someone plant a beacon on me. He undid his cloak clasps, folded the garment, and handed it to her along with the black patch. Get that to our security technicians. I want to know its range of abilities. Soonest. Yes, sir. She saluted again and left. Once she was through the doors at the stern end of the bridge, Kytus looked around and found Captain Neville. Did you see... I did, sir. I run a meritocracy, and the lieutenant shows merit. Put this incident on her record. Consider it done, sir. Two light years outside the Corellian system, aboard the errant venture. The giant pleasure ship, once an imperial star destroyer named Virulence, later a haven for gamblers, shoppers, and vacationers of all species and economic brackets, was oddly quiet, Han decided. Its main hangar bay was comparatively empty, devoid of the usual collection of privately owned yachts, shuttles, and transports that crowded the chamber from wall to wall. Now the only vehicles it hosted were one transport, large enough to evacuate the ship's current skeleton crew, plus a couple of starfighter squadrons, two shuttles, and the Millennium Falcon. Han slouched in the Falcon's co-pilot's seat. There were more comfortable places to be, but none was very interesting at the moment. The errant ventures' gambling halls were all temporarily closed. The ship was serving as a staging platform for Luke's centerpoint mission, and until this mission was done, her owner, Booster Tarek, had chosen to limit staff to the minimum number of tight-lipped crew members necessary for basic functions. Below the Falcon's cockpit were spread the other operation vehicles. Mechanics and some of the other pilots, many of them Jedi, worked among the starfighters. The Antilles and Horn clans sat at a folding table between two stealth exes, playing what looked like a cutthroat game of sabacc. Luke Skywalker walked among all the starfighters, trailed by R2-D2. Han looked at the man in the pilot seat. He scowled. He really didn't like seeing anything from this perspective. Think you've got it, kid? Jags straightened up from his latest simulation run. I've got it. You know, there have never been many people I'd let fly this baby. Chewbacca, Leia... Lando, now you. She's Corellian by design. I'm full-blooded Corellian by ancestry. 
We'll get along just fine. Make sure you do. Restless, Han turned away. This was the fifth time they'd had this conversation, or one much like it, in the last few days. Oh well. The kid wouldn't resent it too much. Jag had to understand the love of a man for his ship, didn't he? A button on the comm board lit, and Booster Tarek's voice, aged and hoarse, came across the speakers. Jedi Recon 3 reports the Anakin Solo leading a formation of ships out of Coruscant orbit. This looks like no drill. Han stood. Good luck, kid. You too, s Han? That's better. Moments later, Han trotted down the boarding ramp, wincing at the unaccustomed, unwelcome sensation of leaving his first love in somebody else's hands. Kyle Katarn, moving easily with C-3PO behind him, headed toward the Falcon and crossed Han's path. Han trotted past, offering the Jedi Master a wave and calling back over his shoulder to the droid, Don't talk them to death, Goldenrod. Oh no, sir. I would never endanger a mission or my comrades through the employment of excessive verbiage. Though I appreciate your levity on this matter— as I have appreciated it many, many times in the past. They say the soul of humor is repetition. A few steps farther, and Han could no longer hear the droid over the sounds of engines being fired up and boots clattering across durasteel decks. More pilots, mechanics, and Jedi were now running into the bay from turbolift access corridors. Miri Antilles and the woman she was named for, Mirax Horn, carrying the now folded table, passed them in the other direction, hurrying toward the distant operations center of the errant venture. Han reached the foot of the shuttle Reveille, the first member of his crew to do so. He leaned against the hull, affecting a pose of boredom, tapping his foot while he waited. Luke and Leia, he in black robes and she in brown and tan, were next. Leia looked him over. Sorry if we kept you waiting. Do Jedi even carry Kronos? She grinned and dashed up the ramp. Hey, do the pre-flight checklist while you're up there. Luke waited with Han while the others arrived. Ben, wearing a black high-necked tunic that was neither guard uniform nor dark Jedi garment, but somewhere in between. Saba Sebatine, silent and imposing in her fearsomely reptilian manner. Iella Antilles, in a black jumpsuit draped with matching utility belts, bandoliers, and backpack, her face and graying brown hair the only areas of color on her, and R2-D2, who hit the bottom of the ramp at speed and rolled up into the shuttle's belly as though he were on level ground. Luke headed up the ramp. All present and accounted for. Han followed. Do you have to talk that military talk? Hey, you're the one who went to the academy. I thought you'd like it. Seal settled into her X-wing, borrowed from one of the Jedi, and she hoped she'd be able to return it in perfect shape, and ran through her checklist as the comlink crackled to life on her squadron frequency. Raquel leader to squadron. Her father's voice, and it jolted her to realize that she was finally going to fly with her father, in combat. Count off by number, and indicate readiness. Raquel leader ready. Raquel too, armed and ready. It was a woman's voice, heavily flavored by an exotic accent. Sonola Tai, the Dathomiri Jedi, one of several squadron members Sial had not met before they transferred to the errant venture. Tycho was next. Raquel three, all green. Optimal. His comm board was slaved to the squadron frequency, as was Seal's, and would be until the mission was well underway, a precaution implemented to keep him from informing Alliance forces of the true purpose of this mission. Seal cleared her throat. Raquel four. Four lit and in the green. Her knee began bouncing. She pressed down on it. Nerves. She had never flown an X-Wing in genuine combat. 
all of her live fire experience having been with A wings and Olives. But she'd flown X wings before she'd ever handled an airspeeder, starting when she was a child, when her father would take her up in a twin seat trainer and hand over the controls. She knew the X wing like a housebound office drone knew the family sofa. Other members of the squadron counted off, their roll call suggesting a Starfighter Command Hall of Fame. 5. Corin Horn, leading the second flight. 6. Twool, an unknown quantity, a Rhodian Jedi whom Seal had never heard of. 7. Tyria Tainer, a Jedi who had flown with Wedge long ago before Seal was born. 8. Cheris K. Hanadi, one time head vibroblade instructor for Starfighter Command. Rake 9, optimal. That was Jaina Solo, leading the third flight. Zack called in as 10. Volu Naif, a Kuwati woman who had flown with Rogue Squadron during the Yuzhan Vong War, was 11. Wes Jansen, 12, asked, Is it over? Nerves. Seal wasn't nervous about the prospect of dying. No more than usual. What terrified her was that she might manage to look like a rookie in front of her father and her father's friends. Dying would be less painful. In the belly of the troop carrier shuttle broadside, Kip Duran snapped his visor shut and turned to Dr. Saya. What do you think? Saya looked him over. He was dressed identically in a good simulation of the all-black Galactic Alliance Guard uniform, though his helmet visor was still up. He nodded. Not bad. At least you have the build to carry it off. He patted his own more expansive stomach. They're going to take one look at me and think, Rear Echelon Bantha Fodder. Kip looked back across the personnel bay of the broadside, at the other Erzat's guard troops, Jedi such as Valen Horn and Jaden Kor among them, anonymous behind their visors. He raised his own visor and shouted back across the troops, What's our motto? They responded with a single, well-practiced roar, Let the enemy do the work! Kip nodded and gave them an appreciative smile. That's the spirit. Aboard the Anakin Solo. Captain Neville approached Kytus in his usual quiet fashion. Boarding shuttles and rogue squadron are positioned, sir. They report ready to jump. Kytus nodded, keeping his eyes closed. He could feel them, the specks of life that constituted the famous Starfighter Squadron, and the clusters of life representing the anonymous commandos and guard troopers who would spearhead the assault on Centerpoint Station. All around them were the greater masses of life force, the crews of the capital ships of this operation. And from them, probabilities and eventualities began streaming, glimpses of possible futures, some in logical succession, some mutually contradictory or exclusive. Kytus could focus on any one of them to see the likely next few minutes of a subject's life. But he did not. He couldn't afford to fragment his attention now, and he didn't need to know the fate of every insignificant man or woman under his command. Maintaining his Sith battle meditation through a hyperspace jump would be tricky enough, but he felt he was ready. He opened his eyes and turned to Neville. Go. The Quarren turned and gestured to his communications officer. The word was given. A moment later, the starfield beyond the viewports seemed to elongate and twist as the task force made the jump to hyperspace. Corelli in space, near Center Point Station. Rakehell Squadron dropped out of hyperspace the stars snapping back to single unwinking gleams, and directly ahead of Seal was Center Point Station in all its majestic homeliness. A round-tipped cylinder 350 kilometers long, with the center third bulging out to a width of 100 kilometers, 
It was the largest artificial construction she had ever seen, and even at her current distance, hundreds of clicks away, it seemed vast. Alongside it, a superstar destroyer would appear as a speck, and there were specks nearing it. She saw tiny triangles and lozenge shapes hurtling toward the station, and more moving from the station's vicinity to intercept them. Names began popping up on her sensor board. Anakin Solo, Vinsor, Panther Star, Saxon's Pride, Rogue One, Rogue Two, Rogue Three. Seal's breath caught. Rogue Squadron was here. The fighter unit Luke Skywalker and her father had founded. The elite force, whose reputation alone was enough to turn back some enemies. Well, she wouldn't be fighting them. She flew in the same force they did. Her assignment here was simple. Serve as Tycho's wingmate. See that he made it back to the Alliance Force as soon as their comm boards were unslaved and would allow direct communication. Rake hell leader to rakes. Wedge's voice did not suggest that he was rattled by the fact that his former command was ahead in the battle zone. Perhaps he hadn't seen them on his sensors. Reveille reports ready. Her target is the Anakin Solo. We'll follow her in, shooting. Do remember to miss. Three, four, you can follow us in if you like, but I have a feeling that your participation here might be seen as treasonous. Leader three. Tycho sounded similarly unconcerned. No, I'll follow. Holocams blazing away. The recordings could prove interesting later. As you wish. Don't get shot. I don't want Winter hunting me down. No, you don't. Tycho's shuttle, Han Solo visible at the controls, moved out ahead of the Rakehells and accelerated toward the distant conflict. Chapter 32 Aboard the Anakin Solo so far, so good. Kytus was satisfied for the moment. His task force's arrival in the Corellian system had not caught Centerpoint's defenders entirely unprepared. The Corellians had a defensive screen of capital ships in position to protect the station, but the enemy were apparently unprepared for the speed and ferocity of the attack, and were presenting less forceful resistance than anticipated. The first round of analysis suggested that they were low on proton torpedoes, concussion missiles, and other physical deterrents. He lent a touch of urgency to the Panther Star's commander, subtly pushing the Sullustan to greater speed, greater confidence. Too much caution would not benefit his task force. Capital ships were breaking from orbit around Talus and Trollis, heading toward the conflict, which was halfway between the two worlds. Even when they arrived, the Corellian force would have less strength than his. The troop shuttles were nearing the station itself. Only two of them lost so far to defensive fire. He could feel more units in play than should have been present, and only detected them because the streamers of possibility predicting their actions did not align them with either the Alliance or the Corellians. He spared them a look. A fighter squadron, on a mission of harassment, rather than defense or destruction? He shook his head. The squadron commander had to be a coward, determined to keep himself and his subordinates out of the line of fire. Kytus would deal with them, make them an example to others, when time allowed. Corellia, Coronet, Command Bunker what you're talking about is treason. Admiral Delpin's words were straightforward. With political skills that had served him well all through his professional life, reading character traits, instantly revising plans to accommodate changing circumstances, Denjax Tepler decided to make a slight alteration to the course of this conversation, which meant he had to lie. Another of his political skills. I'm not talking about forcibly removing Koyan from office. 
but I think you've seen as clearly as I have that he's the sort of duelist who'll shoot his own foot off before his blaster clears its holster. Inevitably, he's going to remove himself from office. At that precise instant, what do we do? Sit obediently by while the war dogs fight among themselves to choose a new coin, or take charge and improve things? Her expression didn't change, but for the first time in the conversation, she didn't respond instantly or predictably. Tepler kept his own elation off his face. She's considering it. Take the violent removal of Koyan out of the equation, and she has no problem with the idea. She leaned forward. Speaking hypothetically, I could probably secure myself in the role of Chief of State just with the backing of the military. Why would I then need you? Two reasons. First, you don't want to govern all of the Corellian system any more than I do, meaning that as partners, we can keep each other's decisions in perspective. Second, half the burden feels like a tenth the burden. I'll manage the tasks you're unwilling or not entirely competent to handle, and you'll do the same for me. She took in a breath to answer, and then her comlink beeped. So did Tepler's, a high-pitched urgency signal. They looked at each other with the misgivings of professional leaders who knew things were bad when comlinks went off simultaneously. Tepler pulled out his comlink to answer, while the Admiral did the same with hers. Tepler here. Moments later, they were in the corridor, trotting toward the bunker's main situation room, Tepler struggling to keep up with Delpin's long military strides. The Admiral tucked her comlink back into her tunic. Where's the Prime Minister? Up on the station. Under attack. Tepler considered. There had to be some way for him to use this situation to bring about the very change in government he'd just been proposing to the Admiral. And the station? Is it operational again? Tepler almost spoke one of Koyan's favorite conversation-ending phrases. That's on a need-to-know basis. But he bit his tongue. Given Delpin's efforts to convince Koyan to cooperate more fully with the Confederation Supreme Military Commander, Koyan had been cutting her out of the line of information flow more and more frequently. But Tepler decided she did need to know. This was a combat situation, and Centerpoint Station was a military resource. Operational as of four hours ago. The techs also think they've overcome the programming that limited the scope of the last beam. If they're right, on its next use the station could eliminate an entire planet or star. That's why Koyan is there. He's composing his surrender-or-die message to Admiral Neothel. Delpin nodded, her jaw set. If the Alliance seizes control of the station, Corellia is the system under the gun. We need more forces up there now, more than we have. I need to talk to General Fenner. No, let me. Believe it or not... I speak his language. She looked at him, dubious, but seemed convinced by his sudden confidence. She nodded. At the next cross corridor, she turned left toward the situation room. Tepler continued on alone toward the Prime Minister's communications chamber. The Reveille raced toward the Anakin Solo arcing to pass well clear of an engagement between a Corellian frigate and an Alliance starfighter squadron. Seal fumed. The Reveille was broadcasting its true registration, its correct password, both belonging to Tycho, the information having been sliced out of its computers by Seal's own mother, who was now aboard the shuttle. Rake Hell Leader, 
begin firing. All around Sial, the other Raikal pilots opened up on the shuttle, or rather, began firing in its general vicinity. Shots from their lasers passed all around the shuttle, and one, as beautifully placed as any kill, fired by her father, glanced off the top shields, not endangering the shuttle in the least. A turbo laser blast, bright columns of light in parallel streams, flashed toward them from the capital ship. At this range, the Anakin Solo's gunners were only likely to hit by accident. But accidents did happen. Suddenly, all the Raykels were on the defense, their approaches as erratic as the flight of piranha beetles in mating season. Raykel leader to squadron. Break by wing pairs whenever you feel like it. Or when I say break. We'll form up off the Anakin Solo's bow, outside the range of its main guns. Seal heard acknowledgments from the other pilots and added her own. Then her comlink, her personal comlink, clipped to her tunic under her flight suit, came to life. Captain Antilles. It was Tycho's voice. Yes, General. Break when the others do. Do not, I say again, do not stay with me. I'm going to make my run from here. But, sir— That was an order. Acknowledge it. Acknowledged, sir. A chill settled in Seal's stomach as a notion of what Tycho planned to do occurred to her. Aboard the Anakin Solo A beep, indicating a high-priority query, sounded from Lieutenant Tebot's terminal. She switched from the screen of scrolling security data to the query. The face of one of the Anakin Solo's communications officers, a Rodian, came up on screen. Lieutenant! Yes, Ensign. We have an emergency transmission from the shuttle Reveille, inbound, carrying General Selchu. They're being pursued by enemy fighters and request immediate access to our hangar bay. Do they check out? All codes and passwords are correct. Granted. Thank you, Lieutenant. The screen cleared, and Tebut switched back to her data. Incoming fire from the Anakin Solo increased as the Rakels neared the capital ship. The Anakin Solo's gunners were good. Laser and ion shots missed the Reveille by mere hundreds of meters, but came increasingly close to the pursuing X-Wings. Pair by pair, the Rakels peeled away, zooming to comparatively safe distances. Now only two wing pairs were left, Wedge and Sonola, Tycho and Seal. Another near hit rattled Tycho's cockpit. He ignored it, focusing on the shuttle before him, and on the Anakin Solo, rapidly getting bigger. The plan Luke, Wedge, and their committee of advisors had put together was deceptively simple, and based around the phrase, let the enemy do the work. Was it going to be tough to smuggle a team of infiltrators aboard the Anakin Solo, especially because security had doubtless been tightened after the Love Commander's recent mission? Of course. So the Jedi would just steal Tycho's shuttle with its valid authorizations, and chase it to safety aboard the Anakin Solo. Equally tough to get saboteurs aboard Centerpoint Station? They'd dress up as Galactic Alliance Guard and board in the wake of the Alliance's genuine boarding action. And destroying the station itself? Tycho shook his head. As half-ambassador to half-captive of the Jedi... He hadn't been told what method they planned to use to eliminate Centerpoint, but he assumed it followed the same philosophy. Let the enemy do the work. Use the enemy's strength against them. Very Jedi-like. Wedge's voice sounded in his ear. Break! Wedge and Sonola banked abruptly to port, vanishing from Tycho's vision, but not from his sensor board. Seal stayed behind Tycho. He thumbed his personal comlink, the one not slaved or monitored by the Rakels. Now, Antilles. Yes, sir. There was pain in Seal's voice. Then her X-wing too banked, following her father's outbound course. Leaving Tycho alone, 
staring into the scores of turbo laser batteries and ion cannons of the Anakin Solo. He closed in on the Reveille's tail, discouraging the Anakin Solo's gunners from firing on him. It only discouraged the ones who were sensible, or who actually cared if the Reveille made it. The hotshots continued firing their blasts coming ever closer until Tycho could barely see through his canopy because of the bright flashes just beyond. His cockpit rattled constantly from energy scraping at the periphery of his shields. But ahead was the Anakin Solo's underside. The belly doors that led to its hangar bay opened just wide enough for a shuttle to enter. Suddenly, the incoming fire ceased. He was too close for the gunners to target. Ahead, the Reveille rose toward the hangar entrance and reduced speed. Tycho decelerated as well, but not as much, and overshot the shuttle, his X-Wing's underside missing the shuttle's top hull by three meters or less. Tycho hit the Anakin Solo's atmosphere containment shield fast enough that the sudden return of friction set off heat warning alarms. He could feel the impact decelerate him further, and the atmosphere catching his S-foils nearly spun him out of control. He wrestled with his control yoke and arced over hundreds of meters of bare hangar floor. At the end of a ballistic arc, he fired his repulsors and came down to a jarring landing that would, under other circumstances, have been mortifying. He popped his canopy and rose, turning to see the Reveille rise into the hangar, then descend toward its own landing. Tycho keyed his personal comlink. This is General Selchu. Put me through to the bridge. A high-pitched musical Rodian's voice answered. Welcome aboard, General. Be advised. I am not aboard the Reveille. A half-squadron of Alliance security agents rushed toward his X-Wing. He raised his hands and kept talking. The Reveille is crewed by an intrusion team of Jedi and saboteurs. I'm in the snub fighter. Transponder designation Rake 3. Um, I'll put you through to Lieutenant Tabat. Tycho gritted his teeth at both the delay and the unpleasantness of the duty he was performing. But that was it. Duty. Duty meant he had to alert his chain of command that insurgents including his best friend's wife, were aboard. Duty meant he had to do his best to prevent the destruction of Centerpoint, destruction that he privately welcomed, as it would remove one of the galaxy's most destructive and ill-used forces from the playing field. Abruptly, smoke began pouring out of the Reveille's thrusters. It was far too thick, too voluminous, to be the result of an engine fire. It flowed rapidly in all directions, engulfing the security team and mechanics moving toward the shuttle. It reached the rear edge of the security team guarding Tycho before any of them noticed. Then one waved and shouted. All turned to look. All but one. Overly tense, startled by the shout, the guard fired. The shot hit Tycho in the center of the chest, frying his comlink. Tycho went down, dropping once more into his pilot's seat. Chapter 33 Blast it! Over Seal's helmet speakers, Wedge sounded aggrieved. He's going to get himself— But Seal saw, as Wedge must, Tycho's X-wing threading its way through the barrage of turbolaser fire with the ease of an airspeeder dodging repulsor lift lane markers. A moment later— the X-Wing and the shuttle were out of sight, swallowed by the Star Destroyer. All right, Raykel leader to squadron, form up on me. It's time to annoy another shuttle. Four, you're at your own discretion. I'll stick with you, leader. My Alliance duties are done for the moment. Good. Wedge banked toward the distant center point station, and the Raykels followed. Corellia, Coronet, Command Bunker, Prime Minister's Office. The hologram of General Fenner swam into resolution before Minister Tepler, who adjusted a knob on the desk beside him. 
Fenner was suddenly of normal height. General, we don't have time to fence. Centerpoint Station is under attack. The enemy appear to be trying to board and assume control. Where are the nearest Confederation forces you could send to aid us? We have a few ships near Corellian space, mostly doing reconnaissance. Nearest beyond that will be at Commonor. Fenner frowned. But as I told Prime Minister Coyen, Corellia can fend for herself while he remains obstinate. Tepler nodded. I suspect that Koyan will not remain... obstinate much longer. Have your forces standing by to jump into our system. Fenner nodded. Understood. We will stand by for confirmation that obstinacy is at an end. Tepler hit a button, and Fenner disappeared. He hit another to transmit to the assistant in the next office. Get me Koyan. Immediately. Aboard the Anakin Solo. Sir? This time Neville's voice carried some urgency. We have unsubstantiated reports that there are Jedi and saboteurs aboard. We do know that there is a disturbance in the main hangar bay. Kytus, eyes still closed, raised a hand to forestall further words. He needed to concentrate. His forces were taking the Corellian defenders to pieces, and he could afford no distractions. On the other hand, he could not afford to ignore the possible presence of Jedi either. He carefully withdrew from the active influence of his ship commanders then opened himself up to a different flow of the Force. Yes, there were Jedi aboard. Luke, Ben, Saba Sebatine, his mother. His eyes snapped open, and his connection to his commanders faltered, vanished. Security. Tebut, answering from her station below the bridge walkway, portside, sounded composed as usual. Sir. Confirm, Jedi. They'll be coming here for me. Yes, sir. Initiate Plan Bastion? That's correct. Kaidas took a deep breath. His ships and boarding parties would have to succeed without benefit of his battle meditation. He needed all his focus now. His focus and the forces he had assembled against this specific eventuality. Even now, security teams would be assembling at strategic choke points between the hangar bay and the bridge. Space-tight blast doors would be closing and sealing at other critical points. Backup officers would be entering the auxiliary bridge, ready to assume control of the Anakin Solo if things became too dangerous or frantic for officers here to do their work. And Kytus's additional defenders should be arriving. The bridge doors opened, and they marched in, a double column, eight YVH combat droids in all. Two turned to face the stern as the blast doors there shut. Two dropped to the officers' pits, one on either side, their mass causing deck plates to crumple as they hit. The other four marched forward, then, four meters short of Kytus's position, turned toward the stern. More would be stationing themselves elsewhere in the ship. Kytus didn't think these measures would stop the Jedi, but they might whittle down the numbers of Jedi. They had to. Jason could defeat his mother or Ben without trouble. Saba with difficulty. Saba plus Luke would be impossible odds. One of the masters had to fall if Kytus was to survive this day. Moving so fast that they blurred, the four Jedi, breather masks over their faces, emerged from the edges of the smoke cloud. The security team at the entrance to the turbolift corridor opened fire. Too late. The Jedi were already among them, striking with fists, feet, and in Saba's case, tail. Six security personnel fell in an instant, 
their blaster rifles clattering to the deck plates, barely audible over the alarms howling through the hangar bay. Iella and Han, R2-D2 between them, emerged from the smoke, removing their own masks. Luke gave them a nod, clapping his hand on Ben's back. All right, time to move out. R2? The astromech wheedled his confirmation, then turned and rolled along the hangar wall toward the nearest data jack. Ben swung toward the doorway into the corridor and launched a kick. A ship's security officer, not visible before Ben began his maneuver, rounded the corner and ran right into it, catching Ben's heel across his jaw and staggered back into his men. One was alert and nimble enough to jump clear and aimed his rifle. Han shot him in the gut, the stun beam folding the man over and putting him down. The other Jedi leapt forward, making quick work of the rest of the squad. Han holstered his blaster and smiled at his wife. Nice not to have to do all the work myself for once. Rakehell Squadron approached the stern of a troop transport shuttle. It looked as though it had already sustained damage in this battle. A bow was blackened all along the starboard side, with a fracture pattern on the viewport suggesting that the transparisteel was on the verge of cracking, of venting its atmosphere into space. But Seal knew it was a sham. The battle damage was nothing but a paint job. The shuttle accelerated away from the X-Wings, toward the station and the battle raging all around it. Just like before, Wedge's voice was matter-of-fact. Shoot, but don't hit. The X-Wings closed in, firing. The shuttle broadside rocked as a rake hell near hit grazed its shields. Saya held onto the webbing across his chest with a white-knuckled grip of death. Hey, doctor! The shout came from the cockpit, where up until a moment before, the pilot had been singing something about a drunken Deveronian spacer and the females he loved in each port. Which end? Talus or Trollus? Weren't you awake at the briefing? Trollus end! Saya stared aghast at what little he could see of the pilot's back and neck through the cockpit door. Talus? Trollus! That's the end toward Talus, right? Saya took as deep a breath as he could, intending to blow out eardrums with the volume of his reply, and then he caught sight of Kipteron. The Jedi Master was grinning, shaking his head. He's messing with you, Doctor. Pilots do that. Seiya let out his breath with a whoosh and glared. I'll shoot him after we dock. Aboard the Anakin Solo Kytus kept track of the battle on one monitor and of the progress of the Jedi on another. The battle was going well enough, even without his help. Casualties were higher, of course, but they were mounting among the enemy as well, and reports had several shuttles worth of guardsmen and commandos now boarding Centerpoint through captured airlocks, and meeting tough resistance from station defenders. Luke, Ben, and Saba were occasionally visible on security holocams. They would appear at some hard point, spend a few moments to take out the defenders there, and cut their way through the next set of blast doors in turn. Kytus hadn't spotted his mother, though he had felt her presence, as he had felt Luke, searching in the Force. Luke had found him easily enough. Kytus wasn't hiding. Leia's presence, however, had brushed over him and gone on. Kytus wondered if she might be wounded which would account both for the fact that she wasn't keeping up with the others and that her ability to detect him seemed to be reduced. On a new holocam view, a space-tight blast door began glowing. A lightsaber blade emerged through it and began cutting a slow circle into the hardened durasteel. On the near side of the blast door, four YVH droids, the first the Jedi would encounter here, withdrew several paces, and set up in a firing line. Center Point Station, Fire Control Station Sadris Koyan used a handkerchief to mop away sweat running down his cheeks. 
he addressed the head technician on duty, the bearded man who called himself Vibro, the arrogant neck who had once lectured him on station programming and thumbs in the eye. Any response from Admiral Neothel? Vibro looked back toward him and shook his head. How can I... Koyan cut his words short before asking the technician a question the man could not answer. How can I compel Neothel to surrender if she won't talk to me? He couldn't just destroy an uninhabited world of the Coruscant system as a warning shot. Centerpoint's main weapon might fail again, be inoperable for several days. When he fired, it would be on the world of Coruscant herself. But if he fired without first talking to Neothel, while he might win the war, the Alliance forces here wouldn't know to give up, and they might take the station and kill him before they realized they were defeated. And then they wouldn't be defeated. As if reading his mind, Vibro grinned. I think you should just do it, sir. What? Destroy Coruscant. Show them what this station is made of. We have reconnaissance ships in the Coruscant system, don't we? They'll get excellent recordings. The man raised his arms, forming a circle, then mimed a big sphere suddenly collapsing to nothingness. Koyan stared at him, aghast, aghast at the notion of killing billions for the sake of seeing what it looked like rather than for real political gain. Get back to work. Yes, sir. The technician faced forward again, then stared down at his board. Incoming message for you. Neothel? Tepler. Put it on. Vibro adjusted controls. A hologram of Tepler appeared in front of Koyan. He looked worried. Tepler glanced around. Sir, you need to confine the audio on this. Directional audio, right now. Vibro nodded, not looking back, then raised a hand thumb up to indicate it had been done. Tepler's next words had the faint, tinny quality of an audio stream that was being confined to the hearing of one listener. Sir, we've been analyzing the enemy attack. We don't think it's just directed at capturing the station. Where are you now? Fire control, of course. We're seeing a pattern of enemy movement through the station's passageways. They're ignoring routes that would allow them to sabotage or capture the station more efficiently. They're headed straight for you. Koyan felt a flutter in his chest. For me? I suspect that they have war trials in mind, sir. Ah, uh, I have a shuttle standing by. Airlock Epsilon 34G, well away from the intruders. It'll get you back here safe in minutes. Koyan shook his head. I have to monitor the situation from here. Decide if and when to fire. Admiral Delpin and I can monitor from the command bunker until you arrive. Transmit us joint firing and command authorization, and we'll stay on top of things until you arrive and resume command. Options and consequences clicked through Koyan's mind. Actually, that was an ideal solution, especially if the need to fire came while he was in transit. Tepler and Delpin would press the button. History would credit Koyan for effective leadership if all went well, and would blame Tepler and Delpin if there was any significant outrage. He nodded, decisive. Done. Make sure that shuttle is there when I arrive. It will be. Tepler's image faded. Koyan turned toward the tech. Until you hear from me again. You're taking orders from the Minister of Information and Admiral Delpin. Vibro looked back, hopeful. But we will be able to fire? Koyan nodded, 
projecting confidence. I'm sure of it. Break six to squad! Twill's voice was as musical as any Rodian's, but Seal could hear strain in his tone. Incoming starfighters dead ahead, coming over the curve of the station. Seal glanced between the heads-up display on the canopy before her and the more informative sensor monitor beneath. They didn't show the incoming units, but Twill's X-Wing had better sensors. Squad! Leader! Loosen up by flights! Wedge's starfighter suddenly rose, relative to the shuttle they pretended to pursue, and Sonola and Seal followed. Corin's two wing pairs rolled to starboard and descended. Jaina's drifted to port. And then the enemy were there, cresting center point station, lined up so their angle of approach was directly between the Rakehells and the Star Corral. Seal gave the enemy points for effectiveness and tradition. Though they weren't attacking in atmosphere, they were still diving on their foes out of the sun. They were X-Wings, and their sensor designation was Rogue. Wedge and Sonola were juking and jinking, just as Seal recognized the designation. She followed suit instantly, just in time for a long-distance salvo of quad-linked lasers to flash through the space her starfighter had just vacated— the enemy, a full-strength squadron, broke into three flights of four, each turning toward a corresponding unit of rakehells. Laser fire crisscrossed between the two forces, passing harmlessly as the starfighters danced out from under one another's aim. Then the opposed squadrons came together, wing pairs whirling away as if in their flight they were trying to replicate the intricate spiral patterns of complex proteins— Two X-Wings came after Wedge. One each angled toward Sonola and Seal. Seal dropped back, putting all her X-Wings' discretionary power toward her rear shields. She hadn't yet fired. Still didn't fire. She couldn't fire on an ally. She saw her father riddle one enemy with laser fire, damaging the starfighter but not putting it out of combat. His other enemy chewed at his tail just as Seal's opponent was hammering away at hers. She couldn't fire on an ally, nor could she do anything less than give her whole effort for her father. The two absolutes were mutually exclusive. They swelled up inside her like a bomb going off. She heard the cry of outrage and confusion before she knew it was hers, and acted before she fully understood what she'd decided. She decelerated hard far more sharply than was normal for X-Wing pilots, but she was used to being tossed around by the violent maneuvering thrusters of her Aleph, and threw discretionary power into her lasers. Her opponent overshot her, beginning a sudden roll to starboard, but her lasers caught him. Stitching away at his thrusters, he disappeared in a flash. Debris ignited as it hit and bounced off her forward shields. She turned after her father tracking his second opponent, firing at him. She didn't try to hit him, not at first. Her salvo missed deliberately to his starboard, causing him to flinch instinctively to port, away from Wedge. She restored her shields to normal fore-and-aft balance and followed, herding her target away from her father. She saw a tiny flash to starboard. Her father's target was still flying— but his R-5 unit had just exploded under persistent laser fire. Her own target wobbled, beginning a climb, then suddenly decelerated. Seal yanked her yoke back, assuming his climb was a fake, and hit her thrusters. Her enemy seemed to fly in reverse, passing beneath her, nose now pointed downward. Her reflex had been correct, and he was oriented away from her, unable to bring his lasers to bear. She continued her climb, looping around in a tight 360-degree curve, and saw her target doing the same, coming back toward her for a face-to-face -face pass. Chapter 34 The broadside's captain shouted, Clear away! Clear away! We're coming in hot! Half our systems shot out! The crew of the shuttle currently docked at the airlock dead ahead apparently believed him. 
through the cockpit door and the viewport beyond, Saya saw the shuttle thrust free of the airlock. The broadside's pilot did bring her in hot, beginning deceleration at the last possible moment. The shuttle did not so much dock as slam into the airlock and stick. Saya was thrown forward, held in his seat by the webbing, and a moment later fake G.A.G. troopers all around him were unbuckling, rising, readying their rifles. He managed to get unstrapped and rose, snapping his visor down. He fell into line behind Kip. The side door slid open. Troopers poured into the airlock. The door closed, and the airlock cycled. The far door opened. Blaster fire poured in through it, hitting two fake troopers, throwing them back and down, smoke rising from their burns. Saya slammed himself to one side, crushing someone against the airlock wall, and suddenly his entire universe was made up of black uniforms, blaster bolts, screams, and oaths. A shove pushed him through the airlock doorway. He sprawled on the deck plates beyond and looked up. His comrades were advancing by twos along the passageway wall, sustaining ferocious fire, responding with ferocious fire. Someone stepped on his back in passing. A hand on his arm he yanked him to his feet, and Kip Duran hauled him against the wall to the left. The Jedi grinned at him, white teeth barely visible through his visor. I suggest you fire your weapon. Don't hit us. Saya glared and did as he was told. Firing was good. It was something to concentrate on, something other than throwing up. Ben finished cutting the circle out of the durasteel blast doors and, sweating, stepped back. The plug of metal stayed in place, its edges glowing. Ben reached toward it and, with an exertion in the force, pulled it toward him. It swung open like a hatch, then clattered to the deck plates. A small object, round and metallic, sailed through the hole. When it hit the deck, instead of rolling, it froze in place. Ben began to turn, crouching to leap, knowing he might not get far enough in time. He'd seen high-yield grenades before, and many had a blast radius sufficient to reach him in mid-leap. He was fast, but not as fast as Saba Sebatine. The Jedi Master simply reached out, and the plug Ben had cut from the blast doors flipped over, coming down atop the detonator. Saba's hand flattened as though she were holding something down. As Ben leapt, the detonator blew, most of its force now directed downward, punching a charred hole in the deck. The deck was still vibrating, and Ben's ears had only just begun to ring when he came down again, a dozen meters away. The three Jedi turned toward the hole in the blast doors. Blaster fire began to pour through, its density and angle suggesting three or four different sources. These weren't the narrow bolts of hand weapons, either. To Ben, they looked like they had to originate with heavy squad-level weapons. Luke lightsaber lit and up, charged to the hole, batted away a flurry of bolts, and dived through. The barrage became less ferocious. Saba was next, squeezing through the gap with surprising grace. The noise made by the barrage of fire continued, but no more bolts came through. Ben gulped, then ran forward and somersaulted through the gap. He landed on his feet on the far side warmed but not singed, as he passed by the superheated metal of the hole he'd cut. Beyond, several meters away, four YVH combat droids poured fire at the two Jedi from the blaster cannons in their right arms. Ben focused on the droid's weapon arms, not their appearance. Tall, gray-black with glowing red eyes, built to look like armored human skeletons, their appearance had been carefully designed by Lando Calrissian to anger Yuzhan Vong warriors and frighten everyone else. Their death-like ugliness was distracting. Ben elected not to be distracted. Saba, her swordwork brilliant, was parrying full autofire streams of blaster cannon fire. Luke, more mobile, 
was avoiding the fire aimed at him. Like a dancer, he kept ahead of every stream, but was making no headway, and in fact was being herded back toward the blast doors. A few moments more, and the droids might pin him against the doors, denying him maneuverability, and finish him. But one of Luke's opponents switched targets. It aimed at Ben, sending its stream of blaster fire at him. He got his lightsaber up, caught the first several bolts, and was staggered, forced back by their power, which was so much greater than any bolt from a blaster pistol or rifle he had ever encountered. He might be able to intercept every bolt, but stopping them all would exhaust him within seconds. Don't stop them. Just get rid of them. It was his own voice, not his father's, not his mother's, not Jason's. He angled his blade and let the incoming fire ricochet off it. The bolts angled up and to the right, pouring into the ceiling and walls, and hammering much less at his arms. Good. Now he could survive the attack for perhaps half a minute. Yippee! He shook his head. He could be someone his father and Saba needed to protect, in which case he might get them killed. He could take care of himself, just barely, as he was now, in which case he made a lie of his assertion that he would be useful on this mission. Or he could contribute. But how? Let the enemy do the work. The operation's catchphrase flashed into his mind, and he knew what to do. He reached out with his free hand, grabbing and wrenching through the force at the blaster cannon arm of his enemy. Knowing how heavy the YVH droids were with their layers of laminanium armor, he exerted himself and spun the droid around, aiming its cannon at one of Saba's foes. The cannon fire took the YVH droid in the side, riddling it. It jerked in place, the glows fading from its eyes, then went down sideways, cut in half at the pelvis. Ben kept up the pressure on his opponent, maneuvering its blaster cannon to aim at Saba's second enemy. The droid ceased fire before hitting its other ally. A vent opened on its chest. Luke gestured, and smoke emerged from the vent. But the mini-rocket designed to fire from that port did not. A moment later it exploded, blowing the top half of the droid off, leaving the legs still standing. Now there were two, each facing a master. Saba pressed forward, able to push her way up the stream of fire from her droid. Her target raised its other arm, an arc of what looked like lightning flashing toward her, but she caught that on her lightsaber as well, then ducked and rolled under both energy attacks, rising just beyond the droid, her lightsaber blade extended backward and up, into the droid's neck and head. The laminanium armor there did not yield easily but the precision of her blow and the greater-than-human strength she could put behind it drove the point of her blade through what would in a human have been thoracic vertebrae, severing its head. Nor did she stop there, but spun, driving her point down from a high stance into the newly created gap in the droid's neck. Luke, meanwhile, gestured. His enemy toppled backward and down rolled by a telekinetic exertion in the force to lie face down. It struggled to rise, but Luke pounced, putting the point of his blade against its back. He drove it home, slow going through the armor, and twisted it around until the droid ceased struggling. Saba pushed her dead foe over, sending it crashing to the deck plates, and I Ben. Good tactics, she said, but warn this one next time. The stream of bolts crossed this one when the droid turned. Ben winced. Sorry, Master. Do not be sorry. Learn. She turned forward and resumed her advance toward the bridge. Luke grinned at him. What did she say first? Good tactics. Don't lose track of the praise, even in a stream of constructive criticism or vice versa. Luke turned to follow the Barabel Jedi. His feet ringing on the metal deck plates, 
Koyan sprinted through what seemed like endless corridors of Centerpoint Station, racing toward an airlock that his datapad map said was less than a kilometer away, which, he realized as he was forced to jump over the bodies of a GAG trooper and two dead Corsac security guards, meant that the enemy was within a kilometer of the fire control chamber. Things were bad. Though the corridors were narrow and unfamiliar here, the glow rods dim and the metal beams and panels of every passageway resembling those of every other, he found his way to Airlock Epsilon 34G. He entered it, noted that there was a shuttle interior visible through the opposite viewport, and cycled it. Moments later, he stepped through into safety. But here, in the main cabin of the troop carrier shuttle, there was no one to be seen. Hello? Yes? The voice carried back from the cockpit. Get me to Coronet immediately. The pilot rose from her seat and stepped out to stare at him. White-haired and almost as pale as an albino human, with a prominent supraorbital ridge and eyes as black as space, she was a chief and dressed in the blues of a Galactic Alliance officer. Koyan grunted and reached for his hideaway blaster. The Cheev was faster. She drew from her holster and fired. Her bolt caught Koyan at the sternum, throwing him back and down. All of a sudden, sounds reaching his ears were oddly watery and distant, and his vision began to close in. All he could see was the ceiling of the shuttle cabin. He couldn't do anything anyway. The pain in his chest was excruciating. He heard the pilot speak. Cork forgot to set it to stun. His vision closed in more. Chinneth to Anakin Solo. You'll never guess who I just shot. Koyan's vision failed entirely and he drifted through painless void. Seal's starfighter rocked. Everything outside the canopy glowed in eye-hurting red, and then she was past her opponent, curving around for another exchange. Wait. Her enemy, designated Rogue Six on the sensor board, was breaking away. And Rakes One and Two were headed in toward her position. She continued her maneuver anyway clear sign to her opponent that she was still in the hunt, that she was not relying on her squad mates to end this fight for her. But her opponent chose not to face three rakes all at once. It turned back toward a cluster of rogues, doubtless to return when it had a wingmate. Wedge and Sonola drew alongside her. Her father's voice came across her helmet speakers. Four, this is leader. Report status. I'm intact. Minor damage to my thrusters and starboard topside laser. As she continued, pain crept into her voice. A minute ago, I just vaped a rogue. I did too. Rogue leader. A Duros named Lindsay. A good man. They've made kills against us. Six is dead. Eight is dead or extravehicular. And two here is so shot up I'm sending her out of the combat zone. Sonola's voice came across, a protest laced with pain. I'm still fit to fly. Then you're fit to obey orders. Get back to our staging vessel. Yes, sir. Raquel, too, banked away, and Seal could see a continuous stream of sparks emerging from her starfighter's underside. Four, you're my wing. Yes, d sir. Chapter 35 Centerpoint Station Saya slid to a stop, looking intently at the surrounding walls and doorways, at the letters and numbers painted by Corellian mappers, at the symbols incised in the walls by ancient builders or scholars. He nodded. Here. Kip, alert for more attackers, came alongside. Here what? Here I implement my master plan to destroy Centerpoint Station. Kip scowled. 
Excuse me, but that's what you said half a kilometer back. When you made me fight all those Corsac personnel in what you said was the spin thrust control chamber. Saya nodded. That was my first master plan to destroy Center Point Station. This is my second. Cup your hands. Kip slung his GAG blaster rifle and did as requested. Out of how many? Well, I'm doing three. Plus, there are hopes that if the Alliance successfully takes charge of this facility, the remaining crew will initiate some sort of self-destruct plan installed since I left. I'm actually banking on that being the way to kill this place. Let the enemy do the work. He placed his left boot in Kip's hands and stood. Kip held him high enough that he could reach the passageway ceiling. Rapidly, with tools at his belt, he undid a ceiling panel, revealing wiring above. At the spin thrust control chamber, I spliced in programming telling the station to count down a certain amount of time, then reverse the spin that gives the station its simulated gravity. From another pouch, he drew a data card and began splicing it into the wires above. Which, if it did so rapidly enough, might tear the station to pieces. Very good. You're quite bright for a Jedi. How hard would you like to be dropped? I'm just messing with you. Scientists do that. Problem is, the station's master programming, which is half ancient stuff, half cobbled together by the best minds Corellia could force to cooperate, and half evolved out of the interfaces between them, that's three halves. I knew you were bright. Anyway, the programming resists change. It may reject my plan. For all that I worked years setting it up, just as I worked for years on this one. What does this one do? I'm tapping into data feeds that supply the auxiliary star map databases used by the targeting system. I'm redefining every star and planet in the galaxy, starting with the near ones, graduating out farther and farther with the same set of coordinates. Which coordinates? Here. Right here? Technically, no. They're being defined to the exact center of Hollowtown, the geographic center of this station. But the effect of the hyperspace beam is broad enough that, even as narrowly as I'm defining the coordinates, the station and everything for kilometers around it will be squashed down to a mass the size of a pan of Rishkate, but not as sweet. Uh-huh. And how much time does this approach give us? Finished with his splicing, Sayer reaffixed the ceiling panel. As long as it takes from now until they fire the weapon. A day? Two seconds? Unless, again, the master programming rejects the data I just submitted. In which case this master plan is also ineffectual. Down. Kip dropped him. Saya landed awkwardly, but came upright, unhurt. And what's master plan number three? If we can get to the fire control chamber, we can splice in programming that might cause Glowpoint, at the center of Hollowtown, to overload and explode. Radius of the explosion? Saya shrugged. A few thousand kilometers? I'm guessing here. Kip nodded, his expression fatalistic. Facts, exact numbers, reassurance. A Jedi seeks not these things. Good. Let's get going. Aboard the Anakin Solo. Leia pulled herself along the rectangular horizontal shaft. It was a meter wide, somewhat less than that tall, and seemingly endless ahead and behind. Bunches of cables, bound to the surface above by flexible ties, were thick enough to graze her back, particularly when they reached a cross passage, and some of them, unshielded by accident rather than design, she was sure, 
carried current. Han had howled when his back had brushed against one, half a kilometer back. Han was behind her, Iella ahead, and Iella was moving comparatively easily, despite the fact that she was broader in most dimensions than Leia. You've done this before, Iella. Leia sensed, but could not see her companion nod. A bunch of times. Since leaving Corsac, I think I've spent a quarter of my life in air passages, wiring accesses and turbolift shafts. She stopped and twisted so Leia could see her face. Dusty, with rivulets of sweat making interesting patterns through the dust. As Leia knew she herself must look. Location check, please. Leia stopped crawling and closed her eyes. Luke, back on Endor, had communicated to her the precise presence in the Force she was to look for, and she had found it soon after boarding the Anakin Solo. On that first contact, she had brushed across Jason, too, but had subsequently managed to avoid touching him through the Force. She couldn't bear to touch her own son. She shook the thought away. It was a distraction she didn't need right now. There was Alana, the Chumda, a bright, pure presence. The girl did not seem to have moved since Leia first detected her. Leia lifted an arm, pointing ahead, up, to the left. What's the hold-up? Han, not surprisingly, sounded impatient. Just a pause while I make sure we're on the right course, Han, Iella said. Thanks, Leia. When Leia opened her eyes, Iella was consulting her datapad. Getting a diagram update from R2. Overlaying the original design specs for this class of ship with the plans used by the Onboard Maintenance Division, I'm finding several spots that are just blanks, not officially there. One is exactly where Master Skywalker says the torture chamber was. Is one of them in the direction Leia was pointing? Han's voice, floating up from past Leia's feet, suggested that he was doing his best to pretend he wasn't irritated, and that his best wasn't enough. Iella nodded. Han added some mock sweetness to his tone. I've got a suggestion. Let's go that way. Iella gave Leia a sympathetic look. You could have found a nice Corellian to marry. I did. I'm nice. I'm just... Decisive. Titus watched on his monitor as Luke, Saba, and Ben approached the bridge doors from the corridor beyond. There were a few guards on duty. Not that it mattered. They fired. The Jedi rushed. Fists and lightsabers swung. The guards went down. This was not good. Both masters remained intact. All was not lost, though. Kytus had resources still available to him. He was fresh. He had eight YVH droids. In the monitor view, the Jedi approached the blast doors. Ben began to drive his lightsaber point into the metal. Kytus made an impatient gesture. Open. The blast doors slid aside. The Jedi stood there in triangular battle array. Luke and Saba now in front... Ben behind. Kytus and his YVH droids stared back at them. The bridge officers pretended to ignore the situation. They kept their eyes on their screens, conducting the space battle that raged around Centerpoint Station. Kytus offered a smile that in no way reflected how he felt. Uncle Luke. Ben. Master Sabatine. Care for some calf? The Jedi, lightsabers ready, moved in, paying close attention to the two YVH droids flanking them. Luke shook his head. Care to surrender? If I did, I'd never be able to have more fun with Ben, like the last time he was here. Kytus fired the taunt like a blaster bolt, a pair of them. One at Luke, one at Ben. And yet, in the Force, he felt not one flicker of anger from either of them. That was... 
surprising, distressing. Time away from him appeared to have undone all the good he'd done Ben during their last session. Kytus sighed. All right. Kill. The combat droids snapped into motion, all eight firing simultaneously, their streams of blaster fire converging on the Jedi. Corellia, Coronet, Command Bunker Kepler walked into the Situation Room. There, over a broad triangular table, floated a holographic display of the battle being waged in system. At the center of the display was the image of Center Point Station, surrounded by a large number of Red Alliance ships, a shrinking number of Corellian ships. Admiral Delpin, standing at one point of the table, surrounded by advisors, caught sight of him. Where have you been? Dealing with allies. Demands of state, you know. He worked his way through the crowd to her side. We have the authority to fire the station weapon, and full control over all in-system resources, until Koyan gets here. Where is he? I'm not sure. He said he was looking for a fast transport home. But I think he may have missed his shuttle. And reinforcements? General Fenner is sending them now. He wasn't quite through saying those words when the hologram updated. Suddenly there were many more green ship images than there had been a moment before. Tepler nodded toward the display. Friends from Commodore. The Admiral heaved a sigh of relief. If we can win this one straight up, we may not have to fire the weapon. Not yet, anyway. Agreed. Center Point Station. Fire Control Chamber. The head technician sat restless and listened to the intensity of the firefight outside the open chamber door. The noise grew and grew. It had started with the shouts of Corsac troopers retreating to this location and setting up a choke point in the corridor outside. More had joined them. The enemy had arrived, from somewhere off to the left. Now the two forces were exchanging fire. Blaster bolts kept flashing by outside. Sometimes there were screams. It was all very annoying. And the technician had a secret. Several, really. One was that his real name was Reichel, and that he despised it. His nickname, Vibro, suited him far better, especially after his eighth cup of calf of the day. Another was that he had been married in secret, concealing the news from his family and hers because they didn't approve. Still another was that he had been widowed in secret, his wife picked up on Coruscant on a security sweep early in the war, never to be seen again, until the day her body was positively identified. Hatred was his biggest secret, not the flippant disregard for pain or death with which he concealed it. Hatred for the Alliance. Hatred for the Coruscanti. And his newest secret was only a few minutes old. He hadn't been able to listen in on the holocom exchange between Sadrus Koyan and Denjax Tepler, but he had been able to use security cams to follow Koyan's rapid flight from this chamber, right up to the point that the Alliance shuttle carried Koyan away. Had Koyan defected, or just been monumentally unlucky or stupid? It didn't matter. He was gone, leaving Vibro in charge of the weapon. And he could have told Vibro anything before leaving. Anything. Like, destroy the people who killed your wife. Go ahead. It'll make you feel better. Vibro could almost hear the words, spoken in Koyan's flat, none-too-intelligent tones. Idly. 
he punched up the astronomical coordinates for the world of Coruscant. Idly, he transferred them over to the targeting input of the station's primary weapons system. A female technician at the next station looked over at him. Vibro, what are you doing? Obeying orders. From the big guy. Getting things set up for him to push the big button. He'll be back in a minute. Satisfied that all proprieties were being observed, she nodded and returned her attention to her work. Now to activate the power source. From the relative cover of a doorway into a darkened office, Kip and Saya looked down the corridor toward the fire control chamber. Closest to them, thirty meters up, were rows of GAG troopers and Alliance commandos, many of them protected by riot shields, more of them firing blaster rifles over and around the shields, concentrating fire on a distant enemy. The enemy? Lines of Corsac troopers, and two hovering combat droids, their metal skins a bronze color. Saya jerked a thumb toward them. A lingering part of Thracken Sal Solo's legacy. Not quite a match for the YVHs, but still formidable. Or so I'm told. The air began to vibrate, accompanied by a hum rising and falling from the direction of the distant fire control chamber. Saya frowned, listening. Kip looked over the two forces. This is going to be tricky. To get us there, I have to rush the Corsac troops. I'll have to use my lightsaber, so while I'm dealing with the floating droids, the Corsac troops will be firing at me. When they see I'm a Jedi, the Alliance troops will fire at me. It's going to take a while to get through them all. Saya gave him a dubious look. How long? Three minutes or so. Why? I'm not sure we have that long. Why not? That sound you hear is them powering up the primary weapon. Oh, Kip considered. How good are the odds that your sabotage is going to destroy this place? Well, clearly the rotation for gravity thing didn't work. That was a programming change, which we know the main program resists. I know far more about the weapon targeting system. I am a genius. With the last master plan, I just substituted data, not programming. And although my ex-wives will argue the point, I have to be right sometime. Call it good odds. New plan. Let's hear it. We abandon your third master plan and get out of here. Saya nodded. I like it. He led the way, sprinting back the way they'd come, and raised his comlink. Saya to broadside. We're headed your way. The remainder of the mission is scrubbed. Prepare for immediate liftoff. Chapter 36 Aboard the Anakin Solo Leia finished cutting a hole in the metal surface overhead and pushed the resulting plate out of the way, giving it a little boost in the force so that its glowing edges would not contact her skin. Cool air flowed across her. No alarms sounded. No blaster shots rained down on her. So far, so good. She stood, finding herself in a small workshop chamber, and leapt up to the floor, taking a look around. Tables, electronic parts, computer gear, one door out, no other occupants. She gave a quick look to the items on the table. Complex but rugged wiring and circuitry, hardy cylinders of durasteel, a sophisticated and high-yield battery, familiar-looking buttons and brackets. Someone was building a lightsaber. It was almost done. It needed only to have a shell chosen and decorated, a gem installed. It had to be Jason. Perhaps he was building a weapon for Ben, under the assumption that he would be able to return Ben to his service. Iella clambered to her feet beside Leia. 
How far? Absently, Leia pointed toward the sidewall. Just on the other side. We're there. I'll activate the comm frequency jammer. Iella set her backpack down on the lightsaber assembly table and opened it. Han clambered out of the hole in the floor. Before you activate that, he pulled out his own comm link and spoke into it. R2, extract. Iella winced and threw a switch on the side of the box within her backpack. That might have alerted sensors in this area. Han shrugged. We can't leave R2 where he is to be picked up and wiped by the Alliance. The wall Leia had gestured toward crashed inward. A YVH combat droid battered its way into the workroom, raising its arm toward Han, and fired. Luke and Saba flanked Ben, their lightsabers up, and caught the barrages of blaster damage being hurled their way. Kaidus waited patient. They couldn't sustain that amount of fire for very long. Either they'd die, or they'd figure out how to put the combat droids down fast. As blaster bolts began ricocheting all over the bridge, the Anakin Solo's officers dived for cover behind their stations. Kytus merely ignited his lightsaber, ready to fend off any ricochets coming his way. Curiously, Ben returned his own lightsaber to his belt. The boy gestured out in either direction. Something flew from each hand, down to the YVH droids in the officers' pits, adhering to their chests. Kaidus sighed. Of course. The Jedi had plundered grenades from the droids they'd defeated. As the thought occurred to him, the detonators went off. The combat droids disappeared not vaporized, but hurled into and through the bulkhead armor behind them. The shock wave hammered everything at the stern end of the bridge, shredding officers' stations, setting men and women on fire. Screens and alarms filled the air. Ben repeated the move, planting a grenade on the chests of the two YVH droids flanking the Jedi. Kytus blinked. It seemed a suicide move. The explosions would consume the Jedi as well as the droids. But Luke and Saba lashed out, each kicking a different direction, and the two droids, still firing, toppled over backward into the pits where their comrades had been. In the moment he had before those detonators went off, Kaidus acted to whittle down the enemy numbers as they had been whittling down his. He gestured, exerting himself telekinetically, and Saba Sebatine slipped laterally into the starboard pit, almost atop the doomed droid there. Her leap toward safety was almost instantaneous, but almost wasn't good enough. The detonators went off. The blast caught Sebatine when she was only a meter or two in the air. It propelled her like an old-fashioned munition to the portside wall, slamming her into that surface five meters above the floor, and she slid flaming down into the pit. Luke and Ben looked Kytus's way. He smiled at them and shrugged. One down. The four droids nearest him kept firing. As the wall crumpled, Han leapt backward toward the door, hoping it was automated and would open for him. Leia drew and lit her lightsaber, Iella dived for the hole in the floor. The exchange took place in what seemed like slow motion. Han's shoulders did not hit the door. He staggered back into the corridor. Leia's blade came up and deflected the first three or five thousand bolts from the droid's right arm. Someone shot the droid three, four, five times in the chest. Han was surprised to see the blaster in his own hand, firing as fast as his finger could pull the trigger, his brain not figuring into the equation. And then his shoulder blades hit the passageway wall behind him, throwing his aim off. Aim off. He couldn't hurt this thing by shooting it where a human would be hurt. But at a distance of three meters, he could hit anything he could see, including any symbol on a sabacc card. He traversed his fire 
letting muscle memory and reflex do the work. His blaster shots stitched a line across the droid's chest, down its arm, to the blaster embedded in its arm, to the barrel. Han's shot entered the barrel aperture, and the lower portion of the right arm exploded. The laminanium armor of the forearm mostly contained the detonation. Han saw the composite skin split in places, the rents filling with fire, and felt a tear along his cheek as something grazed him. The droid wasn't down, though. It raised its other arm. Relieved of the burden of deflecting blaster shots, Leia stepped in and brought her lightsaber blade down on the arm, just above the elbow, where the armatures were thinnest. Her blow didn't cut through the arm, not immediately, but the force of her blow was enough to knock it sideways, and the arc of electricity emerging from it missed her by centimeters, plowing into the passageway wall above Han's head. Then the left arm did come off at the elbow. Han continued firing, spraying bolts at the droid's photoreceptors. The droid swung the remains of its right arm at Leia. A potentially deadly attack, it was strong enough to crush her skull, break her back, but she bent at the waist, allowing the blow to sweep harmlessly over her, and straightened, driving her blade up under the droid's rib-like chest armor. The attack sheared through systems, causing sparks to emerge at both the top and bottom of the ribs, and her blade point entered the skull from below. The droid jittered in place for a moment, raised its arm for a second blow, and collapsed. Rather than have her lightsaber be yanked down by its weight, Leia deactivated the weapon, then reactivated it when the droid was clear. Iella, pale, emerged part way from their access hole. That was interesting. Han nodded. Want to do it again? No! They found Alana two compartments down. A frightened little girl in a party frock hiding in the closet of an armory. When Leia opened the closet door, she lunged at them, an injector pen in her hand. But Leia caught her wrist, stopping the blow, and as quickly released the girl. Such a pretty girl, and so familiar-looking. Leia raised her hand, palm out, a gesture of peace to forestall another attack. I bring a message from your mother. Suspicious, scowling, Alana backed away from her. Tell me. I'll show you instead. She reached into her robe pouch and brought out a device, a hand-sized holo projector. She set it on a table and activated it. A hologram of Tenel Ka, doll-sized, swam into resolution. Tenel Ka smiled, her expression hopeful, and spoke. Alana, time is short. First, Bantha Excess Glow Rod. Alana lowered her injector pen and smiled. Her gaze was fixed on the image of her mother, and her thoughts were so transparent that Leia could hear them as speech carried through the Force. The words. The real words. These people are going to bring you to me. Go with them, and trust them as you do me, and know that I love you, and I've missed you more than I can say. Tenel Ka raised a finger to her lips and blew a kiss, then faded away. Alana looked up at her rescuers. We can go now? Leia nodded. We can go right now. Can I leave a note for... for Jason? I'm afraid not, sweetie. You can calm him once we get to Hapes. You don't have time to pack. That's all right. Everything that's mine is still at home. Impossibly, Saba stood, even got her lightsaber up to deflect the next wave of blaster bolts aimed at her. Smoke rose from her back and legs, and stretches of her skin were charred, bleeding. But she was upright, standing on shaky legs. Luke didn't turn toward Ben, but pitched his voice to make it easier for the boy to hear. Get her out of here! 
Remember why I'm here, Grandmaster? Vexed, Luke tightened his jaw and nodded. He raised his voice. Master Sebatine, extract. This one is still leaving. Luke's tone was unyielding. Remember what we're here for. Beyond Jason, the metal shutters were coming down across the viewports. It wasn't surprising. The explosions had to have weakened the viewport housings, and the ship's diagnostics were sealing everything up before the atmosphere could explosively escape. Besides, all of a sudden there were more ships to see out there, and some of them were approaching the Anakin Solo, laser batteries flashing. Luke gestured toward Jason. Jason raised his lightsaber and his left hand, ready to ward off any attack. But Luke's gesture was a diversion. His exertion in the Force picked up one of the YVH droids and hurtled it backward against the faltering viewport. The transparasteel buckled, and the droid was lost to space. Air rushing past the Jedi tugged them forward, and Jason staggered back toward the viewports. But then the shutters came down, sealing the bridge. Meanwhile, Luke felt a pained exertion in the Force as Saba leapt up to the walkway and walked, limped off the bridge. Three YVH droids were left. And Jason. Against Luke and Ben. Jason was Luke's match, which meant Ben had to cope with three combat droids. The odds weren't good. Then the odds changed. As he batted blaster fire with his lightsaber, Luke felt a surge of emotion in the Force. Innocent joy. A little girl's delight at going home. Jason visibly paled. Alana. Suddenly he charged, crossing his own combat droid's streams of blaster fire, forcing them to cease fire for brief moments. He came at Luke, but leapt laterally, flying across empty air to one of the doorways leading aft, utterly ignoring the Jedi. Luke snapped a command to his son. Extract! Warn Leia Jason's coming! He got his lightsaber up and deflected new streams of blaster fire, then began backing toward the bridge's blast doors, toward his son. Keeping his father and the nearly impenetrable blaster shield Luke represented between himself and the YVH combat droids, Ben backflipped through the blast doors and darted to the right, getting behind the cover the door frame represented. He slammed a palm across the shut button and thumbed his comlink. Aunt Leia, extract! Jason's coming! Her voice came back, clear and calm. Already extracting. Go fast! Ben glanced over his shoulder and saw that the corridor was clear of personnel. The only living thing to be seen was Saba, limping along in the distance. Blaster bolts from the combat droids, bolts Luke did not even bother to deflect, poured out into the corridor like rain blown sideways but none ventured near Saba. Luke backed through the blast doors when there was just enough of a gap to accommodate him. They slammed shut, cutting off the torrent of blaster fire. Ben drove his lightsaber into the control panel and kept shoving, burning a hole clear through to the corresponding panel on the far side. Luke glanced over at him. Time to go. Chapter 37 Jason ran through the doors leading to the command salon, flashed past nervous, startled officers there, and hurtled to the doors leading into his private office. His office, with its secret access to the secret quarters, Alana. In his office, he slammed open the panel leading to his hidden corridor and slid to a halt in the midst of debris and the wreckage that had once been YVH-908. Mechanically, he raised his comlink to his lips. Bridge. Report on all vehicles proximate to the Anakin Solo. There was no answer but the hiss of static. He could feel Alana astern, moving away from him. But precise distances and speeds were impossible for him to measure. There was a hole in the floor of his little workshop. 
That had to be the means by which Alana's kidnappers had entered. But had they left by the same way, or out his office door? He had to follow, but the wrong choice could cost him precious seconds. Suddenly gasping for air, he raced back toward his office, toward the access to the corridor there. Aboard the Millennium Falcon Jag saw the button light up on the comm board. Instantly he banked the Falcon toward the Anakin Solo, which was at the heart of renewed conflict, its screen of capital ships now beset by Kaminori frigates and cruisers. In the seat behind him, C-3PO made sliding noises as his restraints failed to keep him in place. I say, sir, I might suggest a more gradual approach. Jag nodded. Good idea. I'll pass it along to Han. Why, thank you, sir, though he's always been reluctant to implement my suggestions. Kyle Katarn unstrapped himself from the co-pilot seat. Not inconvenienced by the Falcon's side-to-side -side maneuvers, he stood easily. I'll be ready at the docking ring. Jag nodded absently. Watch out for lightsabers. Watch out for Durasteel rails. Kyle left. Ignoring further protests from the protocol droid, Jag angled in toward the Star Destroyer, picking a route that would bring him near the smallest number of starfighter conflicts or capital ship laser battery exchanges. He knew his target zone by diagram and by sight, an airlock on the forward port side, not far from Jason Solo's private hangar. Now all he had to do was navigate through a bewildering field of turbolaser and ion cannon beams to get there alive. Seal heard the two-tone musical signal over her comm board, followed by her father's words. Extraction has begun. All free Rakels maneuver to the Anakin Solo's port side, amidships to bow, and draw off its fire. Most of the Rakels were free. When the Kaminori task force had jumped into the conflict, the rogues and other Alliance starfighter units had largely lost interest in the mystery squadron that seemed to want to fight, but had no other evident objective. They broke off and attacked the Kaminori capital ships, leaving the Rakels unencumbered. Wedge led the remaining starfighters of his squadron into the proximity of the Anakin Solo, skirting just within its firing range, drawing turbo-laser fire, responding with quad-linked lasers, and the occasional proton torpedo aimed at weapons batteries. Mostly, they distracted the Star Destroyer's gunners and worked to keep themselves alive. In the midst of all this, the Millennium Falcon flashed by, weaving through a reduced screen of incoming fire, and managed to arrive just above the destroyer's hull, too close for its guns to target. That boy can fly, Sial admitted. There was a trace of pride in Wedge's reply. Yes, he can. He should have kept his mother's family name. It'd be good to have another Jagged Antilles in the galaxy. Stop being smug, leader. Yes, for... Alana in Leia's arms, the rescue party skidded around a corner. Han slowed, leaning back around the corner, firing with his blaster pistol keeping the pursuers pinned down. Iella reached the airlock hatch first, or would have if R2-D2 hadn't already been there. As she approached, the droid tweedled at her, and the hatch slid open. Beyond, the far hatch opened simultaneously, revealing the starboard docking ring of the Falcon, Master Katarn waiting there. Iella didn't even have to slow her running pace. Leia swept aboard. Master Katarn... Good to see you. He bowed. Two injured men in a droid shuttle service, as requested. The sound of Han's blaster fire picked up. Then his weapon fell silent. Leia's heart seemed to skip a beat until she realized there were more distant weapon sounds now. Lightsabers. R2-D2 rolled aboard, offering Kyle a musical note of greeting, and Han was mere steps behind. Luke, Ben, and Saba are coming fast. Leia nodded and carried Alana into the crew quarters, setting her down on one of the bunks. You need to strap in, sweetie. We may need to do some violent maneuvers. 
Alana's bright eyes made a plea of her next question. Can I be in the cockpit instead? Not this time, but soon. With the force lending him speed, Kytus hurtled down the side passage, his leaps carrying him over the bodies, some injured and moaning, some dead, of ship's security personnel, and here and there their severed arms. Far ahead, just past a group of at least a dozen injured personnel, he saw Luke turn rightward at a cross corridor. But by the time Kytus rounded that corridor, the airlock hatch at the far end was closed, and he could see a gray-white hull speeding by. Gasping for breath, he raised his comlink. This is Solo. Do not fire on the Millennium Falcon. Anyone who fires on her dies. Use tractor beams only. He heard, but paid no attention to the acknowledgement from the bridge. He took no mind of the confusion in the officer's voice as the man reported progress with the tractor beams, which turned into no progress as the weapons officer's switch over to the tractor system gave the Falcon precious moments in which to pull away from the Anakin Solo. Yes, I once fired on the Falcon from this very ship, but my daughter was not aboard her then. He could feel her, Alana's shining presence, growing ever more distant, and each moment of separation felt like another needle being hammered into his heart. Finally it came, the report he dreaded, the one he could not forestall no matter how strongly, lovingly, hopelessly he reached out to his daughter through the force. Sir, I'm sorry to report that the Millennium Falcon has entered hyperspace. His legs failed him, and he sank to the deck plates, kneeling in his pain and sudden grief. Center Point Station, Fire Control Chamber Vibro looked over the controls before him. Everything was ready. All it took was a finger on the button. The shouts from outside were more annoying than ever. We've got relief coming! They're making another push! Hold tight! Hold tight! And as ever there were screams, more numerous now, getting closer. The Corellians were losing. This chamber would fall to the Coruscanti. The station would fall to them. But it would be too late. They wouldn't be able to call themselves Coruscanti anymore. He hissed to get the other technician's attention. She was looking behind them, toward the door, something like fear on her face. But now she glanced Vibro's way. He smiled at her. Hey! Watch this. He hit the button. The crew and passengers of the Millennium Falcon, outbound, with their escort of Raykel X-Wings, felt something hammer the freighter. It was like a laser shot getting through the shields. But no ship was pursuing them, and the Falcon's rear surfaces lit up with light from behind. Proximity alarms in the cockpit howled, Han, in the co-pilot's seat, his expression suggesting he would never again in his life allow a situation in which he sat there, flicked the cockpit monitor over to show the rear holocam view. Center Point Station was a glowing ball, a perfect sphere of light perhaps five hundred kilometers in diameter. As Han watched, the sphere contracted almost instantly, leaving nothing behind in the volume it had occupied. Everything that had been there was gone. Corellian ships, Alliance ships, Kaminori ships, and Center Point Station itself. The Anakin Solo, safely beyond the boundary of that momentary sphere, seemed unharmed, as did every ship and starfighter in its vicinity. Han gulped. Was that... Was that Kyle, in the rear seat beside C-3PO, offered a pained grunt? That was a massive loss of life, a cessation in the Force. Whatever was there, 
no longer exists. Jaina? Kip? Jag checked his sensor board. Jaina's on our flank, and the broadside was even farther away than we were. Their transceiver reports them intact. Han sagged in relief. Maybe it was better that he didn't fly right now. Aboard the Anakin Solo Kytus walked onto the bridge. His cloak should have been swirling around him. It wasn't. Why? Oh, yes. He'd given it away. It had betrayed him. The bridge had changed. There was extensive damage. There were bodies everywhere and medics working on them, carrying them out. He nodded. He remembered that, too. There had been a fight. The officers began shooting questions at him the moment he appeared. Orders, sir! Sir, the Confederation forces outnumber us. They're stronger than our forces. Sir, Admiral Neothel is standing by on Holocom. She wants to talk to you at once. Alana. He marched forward to his viewports, but couldn't see through them. While he stood there wondering at their sudden opacity, he began answering questions. Recall our squadrons. Set course for home. We're leaving. Tell Admiral Neothel there's been a problem. Minutes passed. A sound he had been hearing, distant booms that made the bridge shake, gradually became less frequent, finally dying out altogether. Yet still he could not see the stars, and Alana did not return. But a question formed in his mind, a question of his own. He turned to face what remained of his bridge crew. How did they come aboard my ship? Luke Skywalker and those with him. The officers looked among themselves. Then Lieutenant Tebut, at the security station, stood. The right sleeve of her tunic was scorched, and she had a cut across her neck, not deep enough to be dangerous. Sir, we were approached by General Selchu's shuttle, which was being fired upon by several X-wings. We allowed the shuttle to land. As it turned out, this was a ruse. The Jedi were aboard the shuttle, and General Selchu was in one of the X-wings, trying to destroy the shuttle. General Selchu is in the medical ward, recovering from a stun bolt. Kytus regarded her. Who allowed the shuttle to land? I did, sir. It broadcast all correct identification and passwords. It was full of assassins, saboteurs, and criminals. And yet, you allowed it to land. She fidgeted under his gaze. Yes, sir. I was following security protocols. Do the protocols say for you to allow assassins, saboteurs, and criminals aboard? No, sir. Then you were not following security protocols. You did not follow security protocols. And because of it, many people have died, and I could not coordinate our attack on Centerpoint Station, and this mission is a failure. Correct? Her next words were quiet and halting, as though she were giving directions in a language she did not speak very well. Sir, Anyone in my position would have done exactly the same. This is what the protocols are for, to define responses and procedures. I believe my actions were correct. Under the known circumstances, Kytus gestured, raising a hand, and under his exertion of power, Tabot floated up in the air, putting her slightly above his level. Her eyes grew wide. Sir, Kytus closed his hand into a fist. 
Now no more words came from her, just pained gasps. She grasped with increasing desperation at a choking hand that just was not there. He continued, his voice still level, controlled. Lieutenant, we can't have that. Gross incompetence. Gross insubordination. The deliberate contravention of orders and top-level plans. Nor can we let it go unpunished. Can we? Captain Neville approached. Sir, this is not the time or the way. Not looking at the quarren, Kytus gestured with his free hand, and Neville was suddenly flying backward, skidding across the raised walkway, fetching up against the blast doors through which the Skywalkers had so recently left. Amazingly, Tebut was still trying to talk. Sir, can't... Loyal... Loyal! The word exploded out of Kytus, raising his voice a screechy octave. How dare you use that word! You may not say that word ever again. Loyal officers do not betray their command, their comrades, their oaths! His outrage turned everything he saw a reddish hue, even Tebat's face. And there was only one way to restore everything to its proper color. He tightened his grip. The sound of Tebut's neck breaking was startlingly loud over the hum of the bridge's monitors and computer gear. Kytus dashed his hand down. Tebut's body slammed to the deck plates below her. More bones snapped. She lay behind her security station, bent at an odd sideways angle at the waist, her eyes fixed open, staring at the ceiling. Kytus breathed out all his rage. Colors returned to vibrant normalcy. He turned and walked toward the stern. As he passed Neville, still lying where Kytus had thrown him, he said, I'll be in my quarters. Neville stared at him with, what, fear, anger, obsequious acceptance? Kytus couldn't tell. The fishy folk were so hard to read. Moan cows and quarren alike. He didn't like them anymore. Chapter 38 Refueling Station, Gindine System The rake hells, the broadside, and the Millennium Falcon put in at an abandoned repair and refueling satellite. It orbited the world of Gindine burned and ruined by the Yuzhan Vong during the war named for them. Owned by Tendrondo, the corporation headed by Lando Calrissian and his wife, Tendra Rysant, it had been decommissioned and shut down, but Han and Leia still carried the codes that would open its airlocks, reactivate its life support systems. There they swapped personnel around, putting everyone bound for Endor on the broadside giving the X-Wing pilots a brief respite. In the Millennium Falcon's main hold, which had mostly served as a crew lounge for most of the years Han had owned the freighter, Leia and Han sat Alana down on a sofa and bent to face her more at eye level. "'We're going to take you back to Hapes now,' Leia said. Seeing Alana up close for so long, it was hard for her to concentrate." The little girl was so familiar, staring up at her with eyes Leia knew so well. The realization of where she knew Alana from was like rising from a pool after too long underwater. Suddenly Leia could breathe again, could think again. Alana had Tenel Ka's coloration, the fair skin, red hair, gray eyes, but her face— her expressions, her lively intelligence, were so like his when he was a child, before Yuzhan Vong and Voxen and Verger and who knows what 
twisted all the happiness out of his life. Leia found she could not speak. But Alana wiggled, happy. You're Leia Organa Solo. Leia nodded, mute. You're Jason's mommy. Leia nodded again. He's my daddy. Finally, Leia found her voice again. I know, she whispered. She knelt and pulled Alana to her in an embrace. She stood with the little girl in her arms. I'm your grandmother. She turned to face Han. His face was frozen in surprise. Leia saw his mouth work as he tried to find the perfect quip for the situation, but there was none. His expression softened, and he merely patted the little girl's arm, a clumsy gesture of affection. Hi, sweetie. I'm your grandfather. Sanctuary Moon of Endor Death Star Wreckage Jaina found Jag lying on a blanket near the edge of the wreckage shadow, watching the huge reddish ball of Endor as it began to sink below the horizon of trees. She sat beside him, allowing herself a moment to appreciate the beauty of the view. I have to go, she said. Now? No, but soon. A few hours, a few days. Where? I don't know. He grinned. I recommend you figure that out before you leave. That's what I'm trying to do. She shook her head. Alima's dead. Jason's next. Just about everyone I know plans to be the one to confront Jason Solo. Grandmaster Skywalker, Ben Skywalker, half the Jedi Knights, all the Jedi Masters. Every pilot I know plans to be there in a starfighter the next time he's in one. So I suggest you get in line. If it is someone else, I won't complain. But if it has to be me, I want to be ready. You showed me I wasn't. She took a moment to consider her words. I'm his twin. I have as much power as he does, potentially. But he's had training I haven't. I need to counter it with training he hasn't had. And the sort of ingenuity you showed me. He watched her in the deepening shadows. I'll give you whatever help I can. But I think Alima was just about my match. Jason, he's far more dangerous. I know. But I wanted you to understand that you have helped me. Helped me get this far. I just have to get farther. And that means going away. He nodded. Just remember who you are. That should mean everything to you. And remember that it means nothing to Jason anymore. He's already shown that he cares nothing for the families of those he tortures and kills. Those he tortures and kills? Jaina froze as something occurred to her. Those he tortures and kills? What is it? Oh, no! She shook her head, almost unaware of Jag as the thought took hold. I can't. You can't what? She looked at him, hoping that something in his expression or words might tell her why her idea was wrong. Bad. But it wasn't. It was the only answer. It was inevitable. She rose. I have to go. I know you said that. But now I know where. I need to make some preparations. Don't worry. I'll say goodbye before I leave. She turned away from his baffled expression and headed back to the outpost, toward her mission, toward an act of last resort, toward her teacher. End of
Star Wars, Legacy of the Force, Fury, Book 7, by Aaron Alston.